So can you just chuck it in there. Actually, just throw yeah, it in this right there. I'll move this and I'll no, no, put it. No, it's okay. Let's just get some of this cord in here. Well, that way it won't be banging against it. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. Okay. okay yeah. I'll just put it here with my computer. Magic was about 2008, eight, eight or yeah. nine, yeah. Um, that was making advanced discovery in globally cancers or something of that nature. And there was a Magic 1 funded with Morris Animal Foundation, a Magic 2 founded with the Canine Health Foundation, um, funded with the Canine Health Foundation. Um, uh, that moved into... Um, Shine On, which has uh, been, it's about in its eighth year with Hermesio Sarcon, and that will be a large part of today's presentation. Um, uh, also underway currently is COEL, which is Canine Osteosarcoma Early Detection. Yeah. Okay. And even though Osteosarcoma isn't one of our most major cancers, it does affect 5% of golders. Many other breeds uh, have more. And we view this as a team effort, a team effort with all of you, with Morris, with Hand Health Foundation, and with other breeds. So uh, in service to other breed clubs, we sometimes partner with cancers that are not our most. Okay. Um, so the, the new project that we're going to be introducing is called, uh, at this time, name for change, but at this time it's called Lyra, and that's lymphoma uh, uh, risk assessment. And um, so as we get started, just a quick announcement. Um, there's Golden Retriever Foundation literature up here. And we're going to do pass the hat in reverse. Mm -hmm. So we're not collecting money from you. We're giving you information that I hope you will take home and feel that you want to support these studies. And, and the information in here will help you do that. Um, Jaime had a, an interesting remark at lunch. He did some of his uh, training in Texas. 
and he said um, uh, he said that um, an ant colony can eat a cow. So we're the ants, and the cancer is the cow. We need everything. So without further ado, I'm going to start passing the hat, and um, we'll let me start giving the information. Great. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you for uh, the invitation to the foundation and the club and all the Golden community. It's really cool to be here. I think this is my fourth uh, GRCA National. So some of you might have seen the, the dog or the pony before. I'm not sure. Um, but, but this is really different. And I, I do want to pick up on something that Rhonda said where she said, uh, 50 years of cancer research in humans, it actually goes much farther than that, right? 50 years of, of really dedicated investment. And it is true that we have a lot more treatments that we know how to use for humans and that the outcomes are, are really starting to change. And we're very proud of that. And I, I work at a NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. Um, and I'm, I love being part of seeing what's happening to us collectively as a society and how we are um, starting to uh, breach holes in, in that uh, wall against uh, cancer. But I do think that when it comes to prevention, um, it is the same black box in humans as it is in dogs. So um, if you smoke, quit. Uh, if you don't use sunscreen, do. And everything else that you hear, I will paraphrase the experts, we have no idea if it works. So diet, supplements, we, we know that if you're lean and healthy, you are less likely to get cancer. But all the other stuff that's sitting on the GNC shelf, all the stuff that's being advertised on the internet, uh, whether you eat Twinkies or cruciferous vegetables, we have no idea if it works. And this comes straight from the mouths of the experts, right? So our dogs don't smoke willingly, so we don't have to tell them to stop smoking. And most of them have hair coats that protect them from the sun. So with the exception of a few rare tumors in naked bellies or naked dogs, um, naked meaning hairless, right? We don't worry about, about sun effects. And so that means that prevention in dogs is really, really hard because we are in this, you know, we're, we're not even there for humans. So we're definitely not there for dogs. So I think the story that I want to tell you today started um, about 2015-ish. Um, maybe a little bit earlier, and I got a call, and uh, on the other side of the telephone, I heard somebody say, um, hemangiosarcoma sucks. We all know that. And um, we, we would like to ask you if you can do something transformational that's going to change the path of our breed with hemangiosarcoma. And we don't want more, we don't want more of the same. So you guys did magic and the genomics and blah, 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 and it's great, but we want something bold and crazy. And I said, well, you know, it, it just turns out that the timing is right because we've got a test and we've got a treatment, and if we could combine those two things, maybe we could find the cancer before it happened and we could kill the tumor before it was. <laughs> and uh, I said, they're never going to buy it. And they said, we love it. Do it. And I'm like oh, crap, now we have to do it, <laughs> right? Because it's easy to talk the talk, right? So I'm going to walk you through um, um, the better part of an eight-year project in 40 minutes. Um, and, and hopefully you'll get a sense of the fact that it's, it's not easy. Um, you need to be smart, and you need to be dedicated, and you need to be good. And you need to be more than just a little lucky. Um, but I think we're really in a, in a great path. And I want to say that we have a poster child here today. So, say hi, Journey. So, and I want you all to see Journey because if, if Journey decides that it's hot and, and obnoxious and she wants to leave, I want to make sure you all see um, Journey. And I'll tell you more about Journey at the end of the presentation. So are we doing a picture? OK, we're doing Journey. Journey. <laughs> Treats. Come here, Journey. Journey. Someone has to have a snack. Come here, baby girl. Come here, sweet. We're going to do a picture. Hi. Hi. Journey. 
Got it. <laughs> All right, I'll give you Journey. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to make sure you knew because if Journey decides that it's time to leave, I won't take offense. And, and the same goes for you. If, if anybody needs to leave, please, uh, please do. I won't take offense. Okay. So. Um, I, I am currently at the University of Minnesota, like Rhonda said, it's been a long journey. I, um, I trained at Penn, did my residency at Colorado State, uh, postdoc at uh, National Jewish in Denver, then spent, started my academic career as a grown up in Texas, was there for four years. Um, Texas in my rear view mirror um, as soon as I could, and no offense to all of you who are you know, Texans and love it. Um, it's a great place to, to do my work, and I spent a lot of time there as a child, so I do have fond memories. I moved back to Colorado, uh, was at the University of Colorado for a decade, and they called me from Minnesota, and they said, what would it take you to move? And I said, you could never get me to leave Colorado. And they said, what will it take you to move? And I said, don't know, talk to my wife. <laughs> and then they talked to my wife, and she said, oh, I think we should go. So, I, you know, so we've been in Minnesota now for 17 years. Um, the university uh, uh, pays their lawyers well, so I have to do uh, disclosures. And, and the one that is important is that um, I am a founder in um, Companion Biosciences, which is a stealth company right now. Uh, it was formerly known as Canine Biotechnology, and, and, and Companion is right now holds the uh, intellectual property or the licensing for the test. Um, the, the preventative, there's a company that's licensed it for uh, veterinary applications, and Companion holds the license for all human applications. So, um, and, and then the university has a conflict of interest program and policy, and so I meet with them um, usually yearly, but sometimes quarterly if things change, and they make sure that we don't get ourselves in trouble. So, I also have to tell you that I'm going to talk about um, EBAT uh, as a, a part of a strategic prevention uh, process. And, and EBAT is not yet approved, so it's going through the approval process. So uh, it's not approved and it's not yet commercially available. Okay. So today we're gonna talk about Shine On. Um, and in order for you to really get a sense for what Shine On is and why we're doing what we're doing, I need to tell you a little bit more about why cancer happens. Then we're gonna talk about ca cancer early detection and risk assessment, and th this is really not new. Um, the first indication that you could do early detection of cancer was about 1874 with a discovery of uh, circulating tumor cells. And uh, I, I am old, but I was not born in 1874. <laughs> so it, it's, it's been a while. Um, I'm going, I'm going to, so even when you hear about this new thing, it's, it's all a matter of marketing, right? I'm gonna tell you about something that we call actionability. So if you do a test, and then you get a result, what do you do about it? So that's gonna be a really important part. And then I'm gonna tell you about our strategy for prevention and then the next steps. What are we doing now? What are we doing next? So um, we have a vision. And um, when I was at the University of Colorado, we had a, a really powerful vision that was that we wanted, to, we, we saw a world without cancer. And it's, that's a really powerful statement. But I'm a biologist, and I understand biology and DNA. And as long as we are organic creatures made out of DNA, there is no such thing as a world without cancer. Cancer will happen simply because DNA is a reactive chemical. And I'll touch on that a little bit more. So I, I, I thought very long and hard, and, and our team worked on this together, and we, we thought about what is it that we can do that would be transformational. And when we, when we thought about our own experiences with our families and our dogs and our clients, we asked, what is the first and the strongest emotion that people have when they hear that there's a cancer diagnosis? Yeah, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's anger, there's all of these things, right? Um, and we, we decided that that's, those are negative feelings. Those don't help. And we thought that through research and education and improvement and development, we could create a world where cancer exists, but it is not fearful. So we created this vision, or we came up with this vision that we want to create a world where we no longer fear cancer. We don't care that it's there. 
few of us, I mean, we get colds and we're not worried about it, right? So this, this is kind of where we want to go. So by the end of the next 45 minutes or hour, I'd like you to, to remember just four things. It's going to be a lot of stuff, but I want you to remember four things. Um, what, what we cleverly call the SOS test, shine on suspicion, um, can detect the presence of an undiagnosed cancer or the potential that a dog is at elevated risk to develop cancer, maybe as far out as four years before the tumor is detectable. Okay? So, uh, and imagine that, tr that would translate that we might be able to do that in humans 15 or 20 years before a tumor is detectable. Okay. Um, the shine on approach is unique because once we detect that presence or possibility of cancer, we have a direct solution. We have something that you can do besides worry. Um, the LIRA project, which I'll tell you about at the very end, seeks to develop a test for early detection and risk assessment that will be equally reliable or better than the SOS test, but more accessible. By more accessible, what do I mean? It'll be easier for, for owners, vets, dogs, and it'll be, we hope, less expensive. And, and I, you know, if you ask me how much the test costs right now, it's not commercial, so I can sort of tell you what it costs us to run. But then you'd have to, like, multiple exit, right, to what it would cost for a person to take. But we think that um, the technology that we're developing for Lyra will actually reduce that cost. And finally, that um, cancer is intimately tied to aging. So I work on childhood cancers. I know that cancer happens in children. I know that cancer happens in puppies. The youngest dog that I ever diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma was nine weeks old. Weeks, weeks, okay? So, so yes, it happens, but that's, that's one, right? I, I cannot count the number of 10, 11, and 12-year-old dogs that I've diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma. So cancer and aging go hand in hand, and we really need to think about if we are going to solve the problem of cancer, um, are we helping that individual? Are we keeping that, that individual alive just so that they go on to live another year with canine cognitive dysfunction? or terminal renal disease, or, uh, you know. So, so we really have to, to put these things together and think of graceful aging. Um, and, and for whatever testimonials are worth, uh, maybe you can talk to Journey's family, um, and, and um, um, they can tell you a little bit about what, what they think about our um, goal to develop the prevention strategy in a way that not only reduces cancer risk, but potentially actually creates a more youthful environment, reduces biological aging. Okay, okay so Shine On, the Shine On Suspicious Test, uses a patented flat platform, and it detects the environment that is favorable for the development of cancer. So it, it's not only picking up that there are bad cells there. We, we think we can find those cells if they're there, but we're actually finding that the, the home that the cells built to live in or the, the home that the cells are, are building on, or even more importantly, maybe we can find the blueprint that the cells made to build the home that they want to live in, okay? Um, and, and that's very different from actually finding DNA that came from a mutated cell. And then we have a solution that modifies this risk environment and reduces cancer risk, okay? So what, what is your immediate reaction? Your immediate reaction is, really? You gotta be kidding, right? How many of you thought? How, how many of you thought that? Yeah, at, at least, yeah, a few people thought like you, you gotta be kidding. Okay, we'll see if I can actually show you that we are very close to it. not kidding. So when we run the SOS test at the end of a. a, a, a a fairly involved process, we um, assign dogs to either a low-risk category or a high-risk category. And dogs that are assigned to the, um, the low-risk category have a very small probability of developing cancer over a one-year period, somewhere between six and 15 months. So we're saying one year. And so by 15 months, the probability of cancer in, in these dogs, and this is based on an N of about 100, right? So we, we don't have 1,000, we have about 100. Uh, and it was less than 5%. And 
And on the other hand, adult dogs that are assigned to the high risk category have more than seven times that risk. So after about a year, the dogs that were assigned to the high risk category had about a 20% risk and about 50% of the dogs after four years had developed um, cancer. And remember, we started testing dogs as young as six, but some of them were older. Um, and I'll show you some data that says that we, we are not only measuring age, although we might be measuring a component of age. Okay, so if Shine On is so great, like, why aren't you selling it, right? I mean, really. So um, getting to the market is a top priority. Um, and the major challenges that we have encountered, the first was, was COVID, so we actually had good financing in line in February of 2020. And you all know what happened. So uh, financing died. Um, that was actually not necessarily a, a bad thing because it allowed us to do um, some really, really big reassessment. Um, and, and to look not only at the um, opportunities to do business development, but not, not only at the concept of business development of how we were doing this because we were learning as we went, but also to think about other opportunities that would be uh, open for us to do things a little bit differently. Um, and there is, of course, the maturation of science. We've learned a lot more since 2020. Um, and there are some ethical questions that are really, really hard to answer about putting a test and a prevention like this on the market. And, and it's not that we're struggling with it. It's, it's not a struggle to actually know that we want to put it out there. It's a question of how do we frame the educational component so that we don't lie to you? Because that would all obviously be a breach of our ethics. So we want to be very transparent. So we're going to go to the next part. And, and I, I, when I talk about this risk environment, I think it's really important to give you a premise of why cancer happens. And so many of you probably have a concept that cancer happens because you know, people smoke or because they're exposed to things or because there's mutations in DNA. And, and all those are partially correct. Um, but there actually are a lot of other things about what cancer, how cancer happens. So first we define cancer. Cancer is not one disease. It's, it's sort of a group of several hundred diseases where the common thing is that you have cells that divide out of control. So not one thing, many things. Okay. Um, all cancers are diseases of genes. So it's not a genetic disease in the context that it's passed to parent, from parent to offspring. There are syndromes in humans that we recognize make up about 5% of the total cancer burden in the human population where there is uh, one of about 40 gene defects in that family, and those gene defects increase the probability of cancer by a lot, but that's really only a tiny fraction. So generally, we don't think of cancers as, as heritable diseases, as other things that are transmitted through single genes like PRA, for example. Um, they are diseases of mutations that happen after um, birth in somatic cells. Um, and many mutations that alter key functions that the cells use need to happen, and you need to create an environment that allows the cancer to develop. Okay. So um, the risk of mutation is, is inherent to all life based on DNA. So DNA encodes the blueprint of life, right? You, you all know that. How many of you have done 23andMe? A, a lot of you. So OK, so you understand. DNA is, is the blueprint of life. Um, but DNA is also a reactive chemical. I can take DNA into the lab, and I can do all sorts of things with it because it is a deoxyribonucleic acid. And because it's an acid, it means it's got a little H plus hanging out or a few H pluses hanging out. And those H pluses love to pair up with little minus things that have minuses in them. And they do chemical reactions and they do chemical things. And when they do chemical things, they change their structure and conformation. And that's you know essentially how mutations happen. And by the way, there is now um, uh, the, the, the talk that we did a couple years ago um, that has all of this stuff is on YouTube, and if you want the link, let me know and we can send it to you. So cancer is also associated with what we call an age and environment. And we have to separate chronological age, how many years we have physically been on the planet, from biological age, which is the wear and tear that we have, right? So you guys all know the, the person or the dog that is 
old in years but you know acts like a puppy and the person that uh, is you know 20 but looks like they could be next to the grave well that's a difference between chronological age and biological age and biological aging reduces our, the cancer protective mechanisms that we are born with and allows the malignant cells to, to essentially develop into this condition that we call cancer. Um, for, for all of you that are taking pictures, I don't mind. It's perfectly cool for you to take pictures, but um, I should have said the uh, presentation is being recorded thanks to Kathy Madow, so it will be available probably on YouTube. Okay. Really on the foundation website. Okay, great, thank you. And, and you are hearing me, right? Yeah. Way back, okay. Okay, so uh, for those of you that like science, we published this paper about a year and a half ago. Um, and this paper talks about um, how we have increased our own, per, our own risk of cancer as a, as a species, but also the risk of cancer in our dogs by living beyond the age that nature intended. So if you think of 40 million years of evolution or 10 million years of evolution for humans and for dogs, evolving now independently in their own niches, um, we lived, our ancestors lived, about 35 to 40 years until the Industrial Revolution. And dogs lived about four years on average uh, up until the time that we decided to bring them into our homes. Now, that doesn't mean that there were not 80-year-old humans and 10-year-old dogs. There were, but, but they were few and far between, okay? Most, there's a huge, uh, huge prenatal mortality, huge infant mortality. Uh, you know, young men were sent out to, to war and they died and women died in childbirth. So there's a lot of things that, that accounted for it, but essentially we did not really, we were not built to live more than 40 years and dogs were not built to live more than four. Now we live 80 and dogs live 12. And so um, I, I used to say this, so if anybody works for a car company, please don't take this as an insult because things have changed. But back in the 80s, when I used to drive a, a tiny little Ford, um, my tiny little Ford did great for about 50,000 miles. But then the, the warranty ran out at 50,000 miles, and you know what happens when the warranty runs out, right? At 50,001 miles, the wheels start falling off, and. Um, and um, uh, my friend who drove a Honda could drive that Honda for 400,000 miles. So my Ford was a human or a dog, and the Honda was a bowhead whale, right? And the bowhead whale lives for 200 years, and th they evolved to live 200 years, and their cancer protective mechanisms work for 200 years. So if we could actually keep a bowhead whale in our home as our pet and have it live 800 years, 30% of those bowhead whales would probably die of cancer, just like our dogs do, okay? So that is the context here, is living beyond the, uh, that, that length of time that nature intended really increases your risk of cancer. And so how do you illustrate that? Well, this, these are human data, and this is from um, the National Cancer Institute Surveillance and Epidemiology uh, data set. And what they've done here is they've looked at cancers from 2007 to 2011 in U.S. SEER sites. And they have basically said how many cases of cancer occur in age groups. So in the under 20 age group, you know, there's, you can count them, right? But they're small. Uh, in the 20 to 30 age group, they're still small. In the 35 to 44 age group, they're still small. And guess what happens in this 35 to 44 age group? That is our evolutionarily adapted lifespan. And you cross this boundary, and it's not quite flipping a switch, but things change. And very rapidly, as you increase human age, you see that there's a much bigger cancer burden. Okay? So what happens in dogs? So you see essentially the same type of curve, right? Um, and, and I love, these data come from UC Davis. Um, and one of the things that I love the most about this paper is that this paper was written using exactly the same data that was published to say how spaying and neutering was associated with uh, cancer risk in dogs. And this was a big cohort of Goldens and Labradors. And, and so uh, Michael and his group actually took exactly the same data 
and they corrected for age. And the risk of spaying and neutering went away because it was all associated with the spayed and neutered dogs living three years longer. So why do they live three years longer? We don't know. But in fact, they did. And all the risk of spaying and neutering associated with cancer was accumulated in that extra three years of life. Okay? But I love the data because it also shows us that when you look at dogs, you also have this curve where there's very, very little um, cancer occurring in this um, time period. But um, as dogs cross their evolutionarily adapted lifespan, you start getting this increase. And it looks just like the humans, but it's adapted to the dog's lifespan, right? So when people say, well, what about cancer that happens in nine-week-old puppies? Well, that's these guys right here. Yeah, we, we see it. It's there. But it is not the vast majority. And so in humans, these guys are um, the ones that come from predisposed families, right? So they're syndromic or they're just bad luck, you know, S bad luck. And in dogs, because we don't recognize any cancer syndromes in dogs, these guys are just S bad luck. And these are the guys that are attributable in large part to aging, exposure, mutations, all those other things that cause cancer. So um, my friend James DeGregory used this to illustrate the importance of this environment in cancer. And so what they've done is that this is a complicated curve, and I'm going to walk you through it. But the bottom line is that cancer needs this environment to prosper. And so if you look at um, this graph on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we have birth to old age. Okay? And on the y-axis, we have a relative scale from zero to a lot. And, and when you ask how or when do mutations happen in an organism? So mutations happen in an, in an organism pretty much during the time when there is the most cell division. And there is the most cell division during development and shortly after birth. So you accumulate mutations very, very rapidly and you continue to accumulate them over your lifespan, but that reduces as you get less proliferation. When you ask when are stem cells dividing the most? So there's a theory that basically says that cancer is proportional to stem cell division. And it turns out that stem cells, again, div divide very rapidly um, during development and in young age, but they, their proliferation rate drops very rapidly. And you can see that as this is dropping precipitously, mutation rate is, is, increase, is increasing. But then as soon as these guys get to a baseline, this sort of, sort of stabilizes out. Um, and then you look at this, this magic aging concept, right? So different for every species. But this essentially is your evolutionarily determined lifespan. And this is borrowed time. And what you can see is that as you get to borrowed time, you get a decline in fitness. And that's when your cancer incidence increases. So the question is, how do we define what the hell this means? Okay, and we're going to get there. So how do tumors shape their environment? So we think the first thing that happens is that there's a mutation or a group of mutations that give a cell a proliferative advantage to initiate cancer. Okay? And that's this um, cell right here. So this guy now has an advantage, and it starts making more of its friends. And they populate this environment. Uh, and if the environment is unfavorable, it's going to stop. But if the environment is favorable, they're going to recruit uh, blood vessels. Blood vessels bring in oxygen. They recruit um, fat cells because they like to eat. So they're, you know, these are their Twinkies. Uh, and they're bringing a lot of them. Uh, and then they bring in inflammatory cells. And the inflammatory cells create an environment that regular normal cells hate and the tumor cells love. They also repel the rest of the immune system. Um, and then they change the background of the environment. All the proteins and all the stuff that makes the matrix gets changed. And the tumor has now built a home where it can live safely and happily. It's got a moat. It's got, you know, archers on the, on the ramparts. It's got hot oil for the invaders. Uh, and it's happily growing. And then it can do bad things like metastasize. Um, but remember, the cancer cells are only one player, right? There's all the other guys in there. And so when we are thinking of doing early detection and risk assessment, um, the goal is to find an existing undiagnosed or early stage cancer. Or when we do risk assessment, we want to find this environment. We want to find the environment that is being created that allows the cells, the cancer cells to thrive. Okay? 
And the cancer cells may be infinitesimally in, in number. They might be a really small number. We might not be able to find them, but we can find the environment that they're building. So what are the ethical and the practical considerations of early cancer detection? So if we detect cancer early, we need to be able to do something about it, right? I mean, you, um, we're veterinarians and you guys are dog owners. So you bring your dog to me because I decided that I'm bored and I want to go, you know, moonlight in a practice. And I say, hey, I've got this test for early detection. And uh, you say, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let's run it, right? And I charge you $1,000 to run the test. And then um, you come back and I say, hey, guess what? Your dog's going to get cancer. And you go, holy <laughs> blank. Uh, what do you mean? You know, my dog's perfectly healthy. It's like, well, yeah, but your dog's going to get, get cancer. And you go, like, when? I go, I don't know. <laughs> Where? Oh, I don't know. What are we going to do about it? Uh, nothing, but have a nice day. <laughs> Not cool, right? So, so we need to be thinking about if we're going to give you that, that news, what does it mean and what do we do about it? Okay? So... Um, Tests that detect the presence of early cancers when we can find them. So think, think of things like uh, colonoscopies. Uh, hello, all of those of you of my age, right? Uh, mammography, uh, right? So if you actually find the tumor, there is a concept which may or may not be right, but we, it, it's a concept nonetheless, that if you find the tumor early before it does bad things and you treat it, you are going to be more successful. And, and that may be true. There, we have some evidence that cancers are born to do what they're going to do. And that when cancers are born bad, it doesn't really matter when you find them. They're going to be bad. And when cancers are born not so bad, they're not going to be so bad. And maybe you're doing more harm by treating them. But we don't know, right? So right now, the, the NCI says early cancer detection improves treatment. We're going to go with it. So, um, and, and I think the data from, from mammography and, and outcomes could be interpreted as supporting that. Um, but, but if we detect cancer risk without knowledge of time, location, et cetera, um, you know, we, we need to be able to do something. So when we think about these tests, the test should have acceptable specificity. That means that we should have very few false positives. If, if it's true, it should be true. It should also have acceptable sensitivity. If it's there, we need to be able to find it, okay? Um, it should have high precision. So if I run the test today and I run the test tomorrow, I should get the same answer. Um, and, and finally, and importantly, the test should be actionable. That means there should be a practical solution that can address what the test is telling. So we're going to talk about the test for early detection in the market, and then I'm going to tell you what we're measuring and how we're different. So the volition, the volition new Q test, maybe your vets call it the IDEX new Q because IDEX has become the middle person, they offer it, but it's, it's not an IDEX test, it's a volition test, okay? So the pros, um, it's accurate and reliable methodology. The test is phenomenally good at doing what it's supposed to do. Now, listen to what I'm saying, the test is phenomenally good at doing what it's supposed to do, okay? Um, and that is, it's, it's using an ELISA, oops. Okay, it's using an ELISA test to measure uh, little units um, of protein with DNA wrapped around it that's called nucleosomes, okay? And it's really inexpensive. I think the cost to the veterinarian is um, less than $40. So you guys are probably not paying more than 120, give or take, maybe less. Okay. So I, I haven't run it myself on my dog, so I don't know, but it's, it's, it's inexpensive, okay? So what are the cons? The cons are the data that they've published, and they've published a number of papers, do not support their diagnostic claims. And it's not that hard. So they basically say, we took a bunch of dogs with lymphoma, and we measured their circulating nucleosomes. And we took a bunch of healthy dogs, and we measured their nucleosomes, and the dogs with lymphoma had more. But if you parse that out into what kind of lymphoma, or you ask the question, what kind of lymphoma, what stage? It turns out that they're very good at the late stages. They're not so good at the early stages, and they can't differentiate the lymphoma. And then they said, we're going to do the same thing with hemangiosarcoma. And they said, well, with hemangiosarcoma, the data are a little bit dirtier, but the dogs with hemangiosarcoma have more. And therefore, 
We can tell you if your dog is at risk for lymphoma, and we can tell you if your, risk, your dog is at risk for hemangiosarcoma. So we ask the question like, what happens if you run the lymphoma data against the hemangiosarcoma data? And what happens if you run it against a bunch of unknowns? And the answer is we haven't done that. We don't know. So if you get a, a positive, and, and the other thing is, how many of you have run this test? Okay, so your vet probably told you that you should bring your dog fasted. Because if you bring your dog and the dog is not fasted, you get what they call a false positive. So if you're running a cancer test and if you have a meal before you run the test, it goes up, how does that tell you that there's cancer? And what if you forgot, or what if your dog went out and ate the squirrel when you let it out to poop <laughs> and you didn't notice? So I, I think that, you know, again, it's, it's a phenomenal test, but, but I don't think that they really have done their homework about their diagnostic claims. Uh, and, and I'm saying this, I'm being recorded, right? This is going to be out in the open. I, I, this, this is what I believe. And uh, if, if they have da data to say differently, I think that they have the responsibility to sue me, which they can. But they, they also have the responsibility to convince you otherwise. And I think that I, I know the people who run the company. I know the people who develop that They're very good scientists. This is not about doing bad science. I think this is a little bit about marketing getting ahead of the science. So um, what are the indications for the new Q test? I have no idea. I, I can't think of one. Um, and what's the actionability of the new Q test? I, I have no idea. So. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that veterinarians shouldn't offer it. I'm just saying that if you ask me, should I use it, the answer is no. And would I use it on my dog, the answer is no. But certainly your veterinarian or somebody else could convince you otherwise, right? So the other test that's out on the market is pet DX's oncocaine. Pet DX's oncocaine is a little bit of a different story in that the pros are that reportedly, okay, and I, I want you to underline this word reportedly, it has high specificity to detect and differentiate pre-existing cancers. Um, and the company has built a really deep bench of clinicians and scientists with excellent knowledge and skill. So there's no doubt that the people that are working at PetDX are top notch and they know what they're doing. So when I say reportedly, the problem with um, PetDX is that we have no idea what they're measuring. We know they're measuring DNA in the circulation. So that much we know but we don't know what they're measuring in the DNA. So the methodology is undisclosed because it's a, it's a trade secret, essentially. But that means that I don't really know if whatever they're measuring really has anything to do with cancer. And, I, and, and so it makes it really hard for me to, to take the data at face value, okay? But even if I do take the data at face value, what we know is that PetDX oncocanine is really good at detecting big bulky cancers that I can see and that the surgeon can cut out or the oncologist can treat with chemo. And it's not nearly as good at detecting tiny little cancers, although it can't. It's just not nearly as good. Okay, so we have no information as to what is being measured. It's incredibly expensive. So those of you who have run it know it's a very expensive test. Um, and then what are the indications? And I think that the only indication is if we take the data from the company at face value. So we take all the other things that we know, good scientists, they know what they're doing. They, they have data basically saying when we run our test and it's as positive, 97% of the time we find a tumor. Okay, so if we take all that at face value, I think that if you have a dog that has a suspected cancer, so there's clinical signs, there's some evidence that the dog has cancer, but you can't find it. This would be a great test to say you have to look harder, okay? I think that would be the, the, the indication where oncocanine would be really good. Um, what's the actionability? So in the context where you say there's a cancer there and you have to look really hard to find it and oncocanine says yes, then you go and you look really hard to find it, right? But otherwise, I don't really know what the actionability is. And so I've talked to people who say, you know, the, the way that PetDX sells it is um, we, um, we, we had a case, so, that, so they give you a lot of case studies. We had a case, and, and, and the owner was a veterinary nurse, and she had a golden, and the, she ran the test, and it turned out that the test pointed out to the dog having hemangiosarcoma, and they couldn't find it, 
but the, they knew the dog was going to get hemangiosarcoma, so they could pamper the dog for a year. And a year later, the dog developed an atrial hemangiosarcoma, and they were able to let it go, and they already knew, so it was easier for them. And that is the company story. For me, I go back to the previous story that I told you. Like, you're telling me that my healthy do dog is what? And what am I going to do? And so for some people, it might be really good to know. And for other people, you know, so, so Alzheimer's runs in my family, right? And they say, do you want to get tested? And I go, no, I don't, because I don't want to know, right? I, when I get it, I won't know anyway, so it won't matter. <laughs> so, so I don't want to know, right? Um, but, you know, but, but some of my cousins will say, yeah, I want to know, because maybe I'll go into a clinical trial, or maybe I'll eat more spinach, right? And that, that's cool. So, so, so I, again, you know, the, the point is I am, I am giving you sort of the facts, and then I'm giving you my opinion, right? And these are the facts, and my opinion is that if somebody said, should I run PET-DX as a screening test on my dog, I would say I wouldn't do it because I don't know what you would do with the information. Um, but if somebody said my dog looks like cancer, walks like cancer, squawks like cancer, but I, we can't find it, I would say run PET-DX. And I've, I've said that to more than one person. And if PET-DX comes back negative, then worry less. And if PET-DX comes back positive, look harder so you can find it. So that's what's out on the market. Most of the other tests that have been out on the market have already failed and gone away. Okay. So how does the SOS test work and how is it different? So I'll tell you about how we do it and I'll tell you what we measure so that you know exactly how we're different. Um, so we um, ask the veterinarian or a veter uh, an animal health professional to take a blood sample. You don't want me doing that because my eyesight is terrible now and I couldn't hit a vein if I wanted to, but our nurses are great, right? So whether the dog is, uh, the dog needs to be somewhere right now where that SOS sample can be transported to a lab within 48 hours, reliably. So as you can imagine living in Minnesota in the winter, that can get challenging because FedEx gets trapped in Memphis um, because they can't fly into Minneapolis because it's, you know, minus 40. That's like usual for us. Um, um, and, and so in, in this test, we have not run samples from Hawaii and Alaska precisely because we, we have a high risk of the samples not getting to us within 48 hours. We are, we are currently trying to understand if we can use some of the stabilization uh, tubes that are out there, and that might give us a seven-day window, which would be great. A little more expensive, but great. So we get the blood sample, and the first thing that we do is we put it in a solution that makes the red cells explode and the platelets disappear. And this is not really magic, it's just basically chemistry and physics. It's pretty simple. And then we're left with all the white blood cells. Um, but in and among the white blood cells are a bunch of other cells that are really the ones we care about. So we use antibodies, and the antibodies have a cute little fluorescent tags, so they look like a Christmas light, and we add these antibodies to the cells. And then we run them to a, through a flow cytometer, and get, we get all the data from the flow cytometer. And so, um, normally what we do is we run one million cells on the test. And for every one of those million cells right now, we're collecting 33 data points. So we end up with 33 million data points. Okay? And I'm a pretty smart guy. I cannot parse out 33 million data points. Okay? So we use something that's called artificial intelligence or machine learning. And computers are really smart, but you have to train them. So we've created a training set. And the machine learning is what gives us our output. And, and I don't have a lot of details about machine learning, but if you want to um, ask me more questions, I can tell you a lot about how we're doing that. So the way that we, decide, that we design the, the process, um, Shine on One was this essentially designed to develop the machine learning. We collected a lot of known samples, and we fed them to the, to the machine learning algorithms, and we said, here, this is what normal looks like, and this is what hemangiosarcoma looks like, and, and so on, right? So that when it recognized a pattern, it could say, oh, it looks most like this one. Um, so um, SOS version 1, which is what we're running right now in our experiments, had more than 90% specificity. That means that it accurately assigned a patient to the cancer group and, and better than 50% sensitivity. So if it was there, it found the undiagnosed cancer 50% of the time uh, or better when it was present. Now, we're working on SOS version 2, and we just asked the Department of Defense for um, about a, a million and a half dollars to work on SOS 2 
in dogs and try to translate that to humans. And our, our early data tell us that um, SOS version 2 will probably have better than 95% specificity. So now we're uh, on par with what PECDX claims that they can do. And we are um, about 85% sensitivity, which is um, much better than what other people claim. So we're pretty excited if these numbers um, hold. Um, but, but our training set for SOS 2 is too small for us to have confidence, so we're using SOS 1 still. Okay, so how do we know if it works? So we did our training, and then the first validation was a tiny little um, experiment where we had 11 dogs that had hemangiosarcoma that came through one of our clinical trials. And so we knew that these dogs had hemangiosarcoma because we cut the tumor out, and we put it under the microscope, and we said, yes, we know it's hemangiosarcoma. And the dogs went through a clinical trial, and we know what happened. So there was 11 dogs. We took the blood sample before they had, before they had any treatment, and then they went on to get their treatment stuff. Okay, so 11 dogs with hemangiosarcoma, and we have four groups. And so our training set includes a group of dogs with hemangiosarcoma, a group of healthy dogs, a group of dogs with some cancer that is not hemangiosarcoma that we know exactly what it is, dogs that had splenic hematomas or other lumps and bumps in the spleen that were not cancer. Um, and then these are um, unstained cells out of the flow cytometry, so it basically means the algorithm should say, I have no idea what that is. Okay? And, and what I'm showing you here is one machine learning algorithm, but basically I could show you any one of the 11. Um, and there's four axes. So each axis represents one of these conditions that we trained, and the distance from zero is the accuracy of that test. And so you can see that all the blue dots here are hemangiosarcoma, and all the green dots here are other cancer, and all the orange or brown dots here are the um, non-malignant splenic lesions. And these are all the healthy young dogs that we tested. And these are all the unstained cells from all the samples. And the, the, the machine learning says, I don't know what these guys are because they don't look like anything. So it, it works pretty well. Um, and so out of the 11 dogs with hemangiosarcoma, eight of them fall in hemangiosarcoma. And I think it's, it's important for you to note that they move as far out. So the level of certainty is pretty good. The algorithm is telling us out of those eight, these guys are hemangiosarcoma. Um, it takes two more, and it says, I don't think they're hemangiosarcoma. They look like another cancer, right? So is it because these guys here are the angiogenic and these guys are the adipogenic? We don't know. Is it because of the stage of development? It's, it's not whether it was in the spleen or the heart or something else. It has nothing to do with that. But, you know, even if they were here, we are still pretty confident because it's cancer. And then we have one that you can see buried back here. And so this guy uh, looked like a splenic hematoma. And we know that there's one subtype of hemangiosarcoma that we call inflammatory, that we, we have a really hard time separating it from, what, from the splenic hematomas, except for the fact that half of the dogs with inflammatory hemangiosarcoma are gonna die really quickly. Half of them live, and they live a pretty long time, but the other half are gonna die really quickly. So, so in some cases, it looks like this. So this is not surprising, but the interesting thing is that none of them look like healthy, right? So this is, this is kind of a win. We, we are pretty confident that our training looks good. So the next thing that we, that we do is we are going to say, what does it measure and how good is it in the setting of no hemangiosarcoma? So it turns out that our test measures this green line. This aging line is what we're measuring. And so how do we know that? Well, the green line includes all of these other components of the tumor environment that may or may not include the tumor cells, okay? Um, and so what we actually measure are patterns of stem cells and mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells are the guys that make up the glue of the body. So uh, blood vessels, muscle, fat, uh, cartilage, bone, uh, fibroblasts that make collagen, those are all mesenchymal cells. And it turns out that there are small numbers, tiny, tiny little numbers of those cells running around, and there's tiny little numbers of stem, stem cells running around, and they create patterns. And the machine learning is actually visualizing that pattern and saying this pattern looks like a young, healthy, fit dog. This pattern looks like a hemangiosarcoma. This pattern looks like other cancer or splenic hematoma. Um, it turned out that, that 
Um, we thought we were really smart and we're not that smart and the machine learning taught us something, but I'm gonna tell you about that a little bit more. So the patterns are detected using artificial intelligence. And Rhonda reminded me that if I said AI, it would mean something totally different to you. <laughs> so, so it is artificial intelligence. Okay, and, and this is really important. The cells that create these patterns are actually getting mobilized. So, so these are the construction workers going from their house to the subdivision to build the, to plot out the lots and put in the you know, foundation for the school and the church and stuff. And, and if you catch them going between eight or between six in the morning and nine in the morning at rush hour, you have a better chance of finding them because that's when they're there, right? And then you catch them going home. So they're not always there. So we do run into a known issue of lower limit of detection and sensitivity. We are looking for events that, that um, constitute less than 0.1% of the population of cells that have nuclei, so white blood cells and other cells with nuclei in the blood, which means that um, when we run one million cells, we're actually creating patterns from 0.01 to 0.1% of the cells. And, and if you think of this statistically, our limit of detection is about, uh, stretching it really hard, it's about one in 200,000 to one in 300,000. So we need, um, we need three cells to be present and we probably need many more than three cells to create a pattern. So, um, so, so we do have um, our work cut out for us in, in terms of, of increasing the limit of detection of the assay to improve our sensitivity and our specificity. Um, okay. So again, just like construction workers or the henchmen, the, the, the henchmen that do the mafia's dirty work, the cells may only be around for a little bit. Um, the, the limit of detection is a challenge. Um, but still, we decided um, after we had spent about 18 to 20 months doing this stuff, we said, okay, we're ready to, to start shine on three, and that was where we decided we were going to take dogs six years old. I remember we, we chose six because four is the, the upper limit of young and healthy, and we didn't know what to do with four to six, so we said we're just gonna use six as our, as our early cutoff, and dogs have to be six or older. Um, and can we actually do earliest detection? Can we take these healthy dogs that the veterinarian says, yes, they're healthy, they don't have a tumor, um, take their blood and say, can we find if they are, um, going to develop a tumor or maybe have a tumor on board. Um, okay. So the eligibility was AKC registered Goldens, Porties, and Boxers, and you know why we did this, right? Because who paid the bills, okay? Um, the dogs had to be in good health. Um, there had to be no evidence of cancer, chronic disease, other serious conditions. At the end of the day, um, we are going to end up having to toss out data from about um, 19 dogs where the owners, oopsie, forgot to tell us that a year ago the dog had had a tumor removed or something. But it's, it's okay. It doesn't change the, the data. Um, dogs had to be six years old or older. And we actually enrolled 209 dogs. So our goal was 200. We enrolled 209. Um, the data that I'm going to show you excludes um, nine, nine of them. So there's about 200. But um, our final data set's going to be about 184 or something like that. And then we're following these dogs for a lifetime. We still have dogs that are alive. We're still working on following the dogs for a lifetime. So um, this is a really fun story. We opened on January 2nd of 2018, if I remember correctly. And so we put a web page together, and the people would come to this web page, and there was a button at the bottom that said, I want to enroll. And they would fill out the form, and then we would check their eligibility and using a system that's called REDCap. And, and we had no, we'd never done this before, right? So we had no clue what the response was going to be. So the page was actually written on December 22nd, and it was stored in the background, hidden from the world, in the University of Minnesota server. When we came in at 8 in the morning to do the release, 12 people had signed up. <laughs> Don't ask me, they must have been like 14-year-olds, you know, because... <laughs> okay. Um, so... We opened at, at 8 in the morning. There was a Facebook blast from uh, the Minnesota Vet School, from GRCA, uh, maybe also from GRF, I don't remember, from Portuguese Water Dogs and from Boxers. So by 5 o'clock that evening, remember, we have 200 slots, right? By 5 o'clock that evening, 
we have 750 requests. <laughs> By 11 o'clock the next morning, we had over 1,000 requests. It's like, now we have to tell 800 people that they can't come in, right? And we have to uh, tell people that enrolled on day one that they're not going to be able to get in for 10 months because we, you know, we can only process so many samples at one time. Um, so uh, fortunately with co-ed it hasn't been, it's been much more manageable, but um, it won't surprise you to know that we have six breeds and an open group for, for um, co-ed. So um, for, and we decided to batch them into two week periods and to randomize. So we said, if you come in at day one or at day 14, your chances of getting in are the same because on day 14, we're gonna randomize. So by day 14, we had 183 Goldens. And for some of the other breeds, we had like six. So, so, so it, it, there is a difference in this community. You guys are pretty amazing. But it, you also make our life hard because we have to go back and tell people, you know, that you're not gonna be able to get. Anyway, so, so this is kind of a fun story. Um, so at the end of the day, what was our breed distribution? We aimed for two Goldens for every Porty and every Boxer. That was by design. Because the Golden community paid for half and the Boxers and the Porties paid for a quarter. So um, it turns out that you guys paid for one extra Portuguese water. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit complicated, so I'm gonna walk you through it. These are data from the three year from enrollment. So every dog, for every dog we set a, a timeline, right? And this is when all of the dogs had reached three years from enrollment. So it's, it's a, a little bit um, back from now, but you'll see why it doesn't really matter, why this, these data are about as good as anything else. So the green line, this, this is basically all of the dogs combined, and then this is breeds, Goldens, Porties, Boxers. And the green line is what we call NDD, no disease detectable. So these are dogs that are still healthy and they can be of any age. So the youngest ones are gonna be nine because they enrolled at six and now they're nine. And the oldest ones are gonna be like 14 or so, okay? Uh, and we do have a fair amount of older dogs. And so um, if you look, the green line for Goldens is about 60%. So, it's, so about 60, you know, out of 100 Goldens, about 60 are still healthy. Um, the green line for Porties is about 60%, so, you know, whatever 60% of 26 is, or whatever 60% of 51 is. Um, but the boxers are not as healthy. So uh, I don't really know what it means because it's not that many dogs, but, the, you know, the boxers are, are coming out and they're dropping out sooner. And it's not purely an age thing. Um, the other thing that you can see is that um, the red line is a diagnosis of hemangiosarcoma, and the yellow line is a diagnosis of other cancer. And I do have to caution you that most of our diagnoses have a level of evidence of one or two, where one is we actually have a tumor and we looked at it under the microscope, and a board certified pathologist said, this is what it is. A, le a level of evidence, too, is that we have uh, a lot of really good laboratory data, including, for example, a cytology, but we don't have a biopsy. A level of evidence three is a, that the veterinarian did radiographs and imaging and they're pretty sure, but they're not 100% sure. And a level of evidence four is the owner told us, okay? So we, we tend not to include level of evidence four in the final analysis because we don't really know. Um, we're, I, I'm not exactly sure where we're gonna end up with level of evidence three because I give that ultimate decision to our statistician team. But that's what it, what it means. So, most of these are going to be level of evidence one or two. There might be a handful of threes and fours. So when we look at Goldens, 20% of the Goldens, three years after we tested them, or yeah, 18, eight, 18 out of 100, developed hemangiosarcoma. And guess what? Glickman would have predicted from the Golden Retriever uh, Health Survey that about 20% of the dogs would develop hemangiosarcoma. So we're right in the Glickman line. We, we think this is good validation. And Gligman would have predicted that about 50 or 60% of the dogs would develop cancer by the age of you know, 10 or 11. And we are seeing that you know, it's not quite that, but it's about you know, somewhere under 40%. So we're, we're definitely in the Gligman world. So we're saying, hey, Gligman was right. Our dogs are not very different from the Gligman dogs. So that's, that's cool. 
When we look at the 40s, there's a little bit less hemangiosarcoma. This is very, very much consistent with the Slater data from Portuguese water dogs. Um, we see a few more other malignant cancers that 40s um, get, and it's a variety of things. Um, and with boxers, we, th this is a total surprise to us. We were expecting that the boxers were going to have high hemangio burden. Everybody thinks they do. Well, these 50, um, these 50 boxers, there was only um, one hemangiosarcoma. But there's a lot of lymphomas and gliomas. So, you know, I am the first one that goes around saying there's a lot of bias in the data and there's no breed predisposition. But I do have a hard time, if that's true, I do have a hard time explaining this. So there might be some breed predisposition. But basically, the bottom line is that we have enough numbers to actually be able to make some problems. So then we actually say, if we look at our predictions, so we take the AI and we say, regardless of whether the dogs had disease, developed disease, what did we predict? So it turns out that our predictions were that um, Goldens and Boxers um, had higher risk in general when we measured them than Portuguese water dogs. And so the distribution in Goldens is about, you know, 55, 40. Um, the distribution in Boxers is, you know, a little bit more like 55, 35. And in Portis, it's a little bit different. Um, so you could argue that Portis age more slowly. And so we might be measuring a biological age and, and Portis age more slowly, and that could explain this. But that's only an interpretation. It's not, you know, these are the data, and anything else that I tell you is an interpretation. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, so then when we look actually at what happened after three years, um, what happened to low risk and high risk? So if, you're, if you are a dog assigned to the low risk group, this is your time zero. Um, by um, about three months, none of the dogs had cancer. By about six months, one of the dogs had cancer. By about a year, um, I think three of the dogs had cancer. So these, these two groups for round numbers are about 100 each. That's, that's about where it ended up being. Um, and um, by the time you get to about 15 months, um, you see that there's an inflection and this curve starts dropping. Okay? And we're going to get back to this. So, so if you think of a dog that's got a low risk assignment uh, over a year, less than 5% of those dogs, so about 3 out of 100, developed a malignant life-threatening cancer. When we look at the dogs that were assigned to the high risk category, by the time we get out to one month, we're already starting to see a few cases. These dogs probably had an undiagnosed cancer, and it was diagnosed not because of us. It was diagnosed because it became a clinical entity shortly after the dog um, did the test. Remember, we were not reporting these results. We were just hoarding them and saying, thank you for, for sending us the blood. Uh, you don't need to do anything else, or we want another blood for a validation test. It's really interesting that when we said um, we want another sample, people immediately thought it meant that the dog was at high risk. That's not what we meant. We now know better. Um, but, but anyway, so um, what you see is this line just drops kind of like consistently, right? So by the time you get out to a year, we have about 20 to 25 percent of the dogs having been diagnosed with a life-threatening cancer. And by the time we get out to two years, we're, we're up to about 30 percent. Okay? So I want to bring you back to this line. What happens here? Well, time doesn't stand still, right? I'm older today than I was yesterday, and I will be older tomorrow than I am today. So when we actually tested some of these dogs, we were not testing them repeatedly. We just had one test, and we followed them. So when we came back and we retested some of these dogs, they had swapped over to the high-risk group. So I think what would happen is if I go and I take this line and I retest all these dogs right here, um, they're going to split off into some that are still low risk, and they're going to stay up here. But then some of them are going to have converted to high risk, and they're going to account for these guys. And if I test them over here, that line's going to split again, and the low risk is going to stay up here, and the high risk is going to come here. And how do I know that? Well, because if I actually follow the dogs out to um, about four years, 60, 1,500 days, um, we see that this is the graph that I showed you earlier right here. And what happens is all the low-risk dogs that are now two years older start looking very much like the high-risk dogs. Okay? So these guys are getting older, their risk is changing, and now the probability of cancer is going to be the same. 
So, and I'm going to show you some data later that, that, that tell us why and when we stop, we would stop testing the dogs because it really wouldn't matter anymore. Um, but, but we think that this tells us that you could take a dog that was um, uh, six years old and you could bring it and test it every year and that the test would be reasonably interpretable for a low risk test being good for about a year and you could test again a year later and again a year later until we said you shouldn't test anymore. And now what do we do about the high, about the high risk population? So again, to repeat that, the SOS test can be used to assign healthy adult dogs to a risk group for cancer. Low risk means that probability for, for developing cancer over the next six to 15 months is pretty low and a high risk means that the risk is greater, but it's not absolute, right? So they are at risk, somebody poured gasoline over them, but they maybe didn't light the match. So how do we use the test? Low risk, you would retest yearly, high risk. You screen for the presence of cancer for those that develop cancer very early on, and or you consider that magic preventable, preventative intervention. So what is the preventative intervention? And this really is what sets us apart from everybody else, because we say if you're at high risk, we think we have something that you can do, okay? So actionability. What good is the test if it doesn't tell us what to do next? So what's the risk-benefit ratio of knowing that a cancer might happen and what do we do about it versus the anxiety of anticipating that a cancer might happen, right? And, and we think that there, there is risk here because knowing that, that there, a cancer might happen and, and the anxiety that goes with that could change our relationship with our dogs and the extreme it could lead to that dog being rehomed or euthanized. So we want to be really careful about how we use this. So um, the actionability of the SOS test, the, the, the other half of, of this test was EBAT. And EBAT was developed totally independently and serendipitously, but um, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the story. And so EBAT stands for Epidermal Growth Factor Bispecific Angiotoxin. And it was developed, it was invented, created, developed by uh, my colleague, Dr. Dan Valera. And what he thought was that he would make a drug that would bind where epidermal growth factor was kind of like the, the, guided, the guidance system of the missile. And it would bind to a, a protein on the outside of the cells, of the tumor cells. It's called epidermal growth factor. Um, and it would at attack the tumor cells. And then he had another protein attached to it, which was called urokinase. And urokinase is a protein that normally circulates in the blood. And it cuts other proteins, but it also binds to receptor. So he cut out the part that cuts other proteins and he just kept the part that binds to the receptor. And in the literature, it said that urokinase receptors were only expressed in embryonic development and then almost exclusively in um, the blood vessel cells that were feeding a tumor. So he said, if I can target the cells that, the blood vessel cells that are feeding the tumor, I kill the tumor cells, I kill the blood vessels, I solve cancer. And how did he do that? He had this guidance system and he attached a lethal bacterial toxin that's called pseudomonas exotoxin. And then he said, well, I don't like a lethal bacterial toxin. I want to make it super lethal. So he genetically modified the, the, the toxin to make it super lethal uh, and to hide it from the immune system. And he said, and I'm, I'm counting on my guidance system to make it really safe. And we said, really? And then he showed us the mouse data. Actually, there's a really fun story, and if you have time, I'll tell you later about putting the right person in the right place at the right time without even intending to do it. It's, it's all about creating the right environment. So EBAT attacks the malignant tumor cells, but it turns out that it doesn't really have that much of an effect on the blood vessel set, cells that, that feed the tumor, but it actually, you know those mesenchymal cells and inflammatory cells that I showed you? It targets those, and for the inflammatory cells, uh, one subset of those that's really terribly evil, it kills them. And another subset that's less evil, it actually makes them immune. It actually converts, converts them to help the immune system. And it, it wipes out the bad fibroblasts and the bad fat cells. And, and so it creates a really inhospitable home for the tumor to live in. Okay? So we've, committed, we've completed three clinical trials in dogs. These were in sick dogs with cancer. Um, and a company called Anavive licensed it, and they're taking it through FDA approval, and it's going well. I don't know when or if, but I think we're pretty close. They are pretty close. Okay. So this is what EBAT looks like. Here's the epidermal growth factor um, protein, the 
um, amino terminal um, part of uh, urokinase, um, our um, exotoxin friend. So these are the guys that bring it to the cells. They don't really interrupt signaling. They just deliver this lethal bacterial toxin. The, ba the bacterial toxin gets in and says, hi, cell, you're not going to make any more protein ever in your life again. The cell doesn't have any protein and dies. So um, that's how it works. So it turns out that these, these receptors are hardly ever expressed together in normal cells, but they're expressed together commonly in the tumor. So the, the protein can seek out the tumor cells and kill them. But we know we can't ever kill all the tumor cells in a, in a, all the malignant cells in a tumor. So it turns out, like I said, that it finds these inflammatory cells and supporting cells, and, and it also kills them or changes their function. So one of the things that we found was that this was extremely safe. There's many, many therapies in the human world that are targeting epidermal growth factor receptors, and they all have, they're all super effective, and they all have terrible side effects. So any itis or osis that you can imagine in the dictionary, these drugs cause it with a vengeance. So the people live, but there are side effects. Um, so we were expecting some pretty serious side effects, and we just did not see them. The side effects that we saw was that the, the dogs, during administration, their blood pressure drops, and they can get woozy, and sometimes they can go like clunk. But then we give them fluids, and they go, oh, hi, I'm up. And, so, um, and then about 10% of the dogs, um, their liver enzymes go up, and then we watch them, and three days later, the liver enzymes go down. And that's it. Those are, those are the only side effects that we've seen. And we've looked really hard. And we haven't found anything else. So targets cancer cells. It creates an environment that's inhospitable for tumor growth. And it, it activates the immune system. And we have a lot of mouse data that I can tell you. But this is the really cool thing. So this is the first dog that we treated in prevention. This is not Journey, by the way. This is another dog. And so what, what this dog came in through Shine on 3, and it had a test. Um, and it was high risk. And it was randomly selected to get a second test. So we got a second test about 60 days later, and it was still high risk. And so um, we talked to the owners, and we told them a little bit more about the study, and they were very motivated. So we ran a third test, and it was still high risk. So we're getting like, you know, our, our, our reproducibility is pretty good, right? It's high risk, high risk, high risk. So um, they said, yeah, we, we are very interested in doing EBAT. So they came to University of Minnesota. We took a blood sample before we gave them EBAT. And dog was high risk. So EBAT is three treatments spread over a week. So uh, Friday, Wednesday, Monday, we tested this dog on Monday. And it was still high risk. And then uh, we were supposed to test the dog 21 days later. We forgot. Um, something happened. But we got the blood sample 120 days later. And the dog was low risk. And this was like, wow. But this is an N of 1, right? But this is like, wow. And so we, um, we have followed this dog. And this dog died earlier this year um, at uh, the age of uh, 13 plus, um, almost four years after its prevention with no evidence of cancer. N of 1. Okay. So what else have we done? Seven dogs treated with EVAT. Number seven just finished uh, on uh, uh, Wednesday um, uh, last week. So I have data on six, but we've done seven. Um, the, the side effects are mild and transient. So overall, the treatment's pretty well tolerated. And um, of course, you can ask Beth. Um, I, I think the first couple of days with Journey were a little rough. Um, but, you know, whether it was EVAT or not, I don't know. We have seen dogs that get a little bit of a GI upset and liver enzymes. So generally speaking, the dogs um, have done pretty well. Oops. Um, five of the seven dogs are alive. Two dogs died. Um, um, the one that I told you died uh, 1,200 days after the intervention with no evidence of cancer. So the only thing that the vet and the owner can tell us is that she died of organ failure because she was 13. She was a 13-year-old boxer, and you know they only live so long. Um, the other dog that died was also a boxer, and she she died. Sorry about that. Uh, about 10 months after the intervention of arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So it's a boxer heart thing. Uh, no cancer. So she had heart disease. We did not cure the heart disease, but she had no cancer. Um, the other dogs um, have been around for uh, over, well, except the one that we just finished. They're, they've all 
past their one year anniversary. Uh, I think Amber sends people like little uh, emojis of a birthday cake. Um, but but we you you met oops, you met uh, Journey, and so um, Journey is now four hundred and some days out, right? I think. Um, and, and, and the family tells us that um, we turned Journey into a puppy. And, and you can talk to Beth and she can tell you. I mean, she has been sending us pictures and she says that Journey was sort of a typical 11-year-old golden and now she's like a four-year-old golden and she gets into trouble and, you know. Um, so, you know, I see Journey and I go, no, she's no trouble. She's an angel, but anyway. <laughs> so, you know, again, this is, this is an anecdote. It's one. Um, I think that if we get to, our goal is to do 12. And based on all the data we have, if we do 12, and by the end of one year we have zero cancers or maybe one cancer, it's pretty damn close to a home run. It's a tiny little number, right? But if you extrapolate statistics, we are doing really well. If it turns out that the next six that we do get cancer by four months, then we know that we just got lucky with the first six. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But you can tell we're excited. We, we are very excited. So what are we doing now? We're following the dogs in Shine On for the duration of their lifetime. We've continued testing more than 40 dogs. And we, now we know that if the dogs are of a certain age, they're always going to be high risk no matter what. So, so no matter how much EBAT we get them, we cannot convert them to low risk once they get to the 12-ish, we think. Okay. Um, the dogs that are assigned to the high-risk group are, are going to be assigned to EVAT prevention, and we're characterizing how this high-risk environment and aging go hand in hand. So this, this is some of the age data. This is the single test that we did at the beginning, and we, we were wondering, is it just the old dogs that we're picking up? And so what you can see here is that when we look at the dogs that were between 6 and 8, so there's about 64 of them in, uh, in this group, and... Um, it's about the same, right? Uh, when we look at the 7 to 10s, still about the same. And then it sort of flips. Once we get to the 10-year-olds, we definitely notice that there's an, an age impact. And I, I can't interpret these data. There's not enough dogs for us to say anything. So ignore the last line. Um, there's something happening here. So we think that if you were going to go into the shine-on prevention uh, or the shine-on detection story, you would start at six and you would probably test till about 10. And by the time your dog got 10, if you said, my dog is a really young 11, sure, go ahead and test it. But if you said, yeah, my dog is kind of an old 11, you know, that, that becomes a lot more iffy. And, you know, we don't tell you what to do, but we give you the information for you to make those decisions. So, so we think we are measuring an, an age component and that age is biological age, but it's not purely chronological age. Um, and that's what makes it really exciting because we're actually working with another group to say, can we use this test or something similar to, to do early detection of Alzheimer's? And then if we do early detection of Alzheimer's, what do we do about it? So like, can we do intracranial EBAT? I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. We don't really know what we would do, but we are working with the uh, Seno group at Mayo and at the University of Minnesota to try to understand if we can address um, the, the, the neurological decline using this similar approach. So we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so I'm going to spend a minute on co-ed. So canine osteosarcoma sarcoma early detection, seven groups, six uh, breed focused, one anybody that happens to be a big dog. Um, we're using a patented platform to detect patterns created by RNA. So this is not cells or DNA, this is RNA. And the RNA is packaged into these tiny little vesicles called exosomes that cells spit out into the circulation. Um, they provide a window into, into what's happening in those cells. Um, we would use EBAT also as our lead product in making COET actionable because um, EBAT is, is very, very effective at killing sarcoma cells, including osteosarcoma. So we think that it could fit into the prevention window for osteosarcoma. Um, and so we have a pipeline that will follow in the steps of EBAT to really understand if co-ed and shine on do the same. Are they complementary? Are they overlapping? When would we use either one of them? Um, and then I'm going to spend maybe five or eight more minutes on Lyra. So lymphoma is a disease that happens across all vertebrates from, from hagfishes. I think either hagfishes or lampreys 
there's, there are reports of lymphoma. It's only one or the other, but you know, all, all um, the vertebrate kingdom. So it's a group canine lymphomas are either the second or third most common cancer of dogs. I'm sure you've all probably experienced it. Most types of lymphoma can be treated. Um, most of them are incurable and they account for a large number of premature deaths in the dog world. So we don't know a lot about lymphoma. Um, there's actually more than 30 cancers that fit into the category of lymphoma. And they're, and they're all different. Um, we don't know a lot about what causes lymphoma. I can tell you it's not Roundup. And it's not w whatever you've read in um, USA Today, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> we, we really don't know. Um, but we think it is actually sort of the same aging cell division. Um, we, we are now starting to understand the behavior of some types of canine lymphomas. And I won't spend a lot of time telling you this, but now if your vet tells you your dog has lymphoma, there are tests, and they're very simple tests, and they're not particularly expensive, that would actually tell you, what do I do about it? Because there's, there's at least one type of lymphoma, maybe two, that the treatment would be to scratch your dog behind the ears and give it a cookie. And if you do anything else, you're actually going to harm your dog. And there are some types of lymphoma that it doesn't really matter what you do, your dog's going to be dead in three weeks. And then there's the other types of lymphoma that we, we know we can treat and we can extend life, but we don't know how good. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to do. So the problem with lymphoma over the last five decades or so has been that it's kind of like the blind man and the elephant, right? So, so the elephant is the disease and the blind men are the pathologists that look at what lymphoma looks like under the microscope the immunologists that look at lymphoma as a disease of immune cells, the geneticists that look at whether there's any heritability in lymphoma, the cell biologists that look at the neighborhoods that lymphoma inhabit, the molecular biologists that look at the genes, the oncologists that look at the biological behavior and treatment, and the epidemiologists that look at the exposures. And historically, these groups have been really bad about talking to each other. So, Everybody has their own perspective of lymphoma, and there's not a unified thing that basically tells us about the disease. And so they say that the first solution to a problem is recognizing that you have it. So we know we have this problem, and we've brought all of these people together into a group, and we're trying to address the universe of lymphoma from all of these perspectives to understand it better. So what's the heritability? There are studies that report breed predilection that date back to uh, the 1960s in um, Europe and the United States. Um, and when you look at the data, boxers are always there. And boxers are a pretty popular breed, right? But they're, they've always been there since the 60s to now. When you look at lymphoma, boxers are there. But then when you look at all the other breeds, including goldens, by the way, goldens were not there in the 60s. They were not there in the 70s. And then sort of in the 80s, they pop up. And then they climb up, and now, uh, you know, there's other breeds that are, that are outpacing goldens. And when you actually track breed popularity, guess what? the dogs that get lymphoma track with breed popularity. And of course, when you look at the bias and the data sets that are collected in vet schools and stuff, you know, if there's 500,000 million, 500, goldens and 17 Vieslas, it's a lot of goldens, right? So, so I think that this is one of the things about why people think of goldens and lymphoma. But, um, and then when you look at the magnitude of difference between the dogs that get lymphoma and the dogs that don't get lymphoma, the relative risk is you know like 1.6, 2.1. It's not that big. It's not like a 20-fold difference. So this tells us that whatever is there, it's not really powerful. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that lymphomas are diseases of adults. And when we look at heritable cancers, they happen in babies or young adults or kids, right? And we don't see lymphomas in three-year-old goldens. We see lymphomas in 12-year-old goldens. And then 10-year-old boxers. So, so that does not look like a heritable disease. So if there is a contribution at all, it's very small. When we've done the genome-wide association studies, there's very limited information. So we did um, a study, and the major limitation is that people look at a single breed, and then they make conclusions about that single breed. And I'm going to harp on this a little bit with a girl study. Girl study is fantastic. It's like the best thing that ever happened, but it's one breed. So we have to be really careful about conclusions because we're going to say, hey, X number of uh, X percent of goldens get this disease. Therefore, it's a terrible thing. But you don't really know if the same thing would happen in English bulldogs because we don't have the data. So we have to be really careful about how we interpret single breed data. Um, we found 
uh, working with Matthew and Sharston, and this really was led by Sharston's group at the Broad, that there was a risk um, factor in chromosome 5 in Goldens that was significant in um, creating risk for hemangiosarcoma and for uh, B cell lymphoma. It turns out that Elaine Ostrander and a, a group in France did two additional studies in burners and flat coats, and they found the exact same <coughs> peaks. The exact same region of chromosome 5 was associated with uh, risk of histiocytic sarcoma and lymphoma in flat coats and in burners. Exact same region. Guess what? That region is, has genes that are pretty important in making a dog a dog. Okay? It's, not, it's not a cancer region. It's a dog region. So, uh, I mean, you could, you could argue that flat coats and goldens might have some, some of the same stuff mixed in there, right? But you are not going to convince me that a golden and a burner have a very common derivation. And yet they both have the same region. So if you were thinking, oh, we should breed out the chromosome 5 region, you are not going to end up with a golden. You might end up with a naked mole rat, but you won't end up with a golden. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so so the, it's not a breed thing. It's not a heritable thing. So um, there's also a lot of concern about environmental carcinogens. And I won't go into the data other than to tell you that for every study that has found an association between a pesticide and herbicide, uh, urban, uh, rural, factories, whatever, there's been another study that um, basically said uh, we could not replicate it. So the answer is no convincing evidence that environmental exposures, chemical or biological, or uh, I'm sorry, chemical, yeah, chemical or biological meaning viruses are associated with lymphoma. So why do we do Lyra? You know, what, what are we going to do different? Well, lymphoma is common. Many lymphomas are life-threatening. We can't breed it out. I already told you, you might get a naked mole rat, but you won't get a golden, so you can't breed it out. Don't even try. There's not a good foundation to prevent it by not taking your dog to hiking in the cemetery, right? Or feeding your dog kale. None of, none of that's going to work. Um, it's hard to treat. So we think that this is a perfect candidate for our detect, right? Find it before it forms and intervene, kill it before it starts. Or find it before it starts, kill it before it forms. So how is there a difference from shine on? We're going to use the same type of patterning. But instead of looking at cells, which are hard to work with because the cells are alive and we need them to get to us alive, that means FedEx, 48 hours, we're going to actually use patterns of DNA. And the DNA is much more stable. We can get DNA out of a dinosaur bone. So, you know, that tells you that we, we may not need FedEx. But it's going to be the same type of pattern. We expect that the patterns are going to be independent from the mutations. So if PETDX is, is we, I don't know what PETDX is looking at, but if they're looking at mutations, we are not going to be looking at mutations. We're looking at the whole environment, okay, of, of DNA that is released from cells, not only from the tumor, but from all the cells that help build that tumor, that respond immunologically to that tumor. Um, and um, again, because the DNA is more stable, it makes it easier and it also makes it cheaper. So we think that we're going to be able to offer this test. If, if we develop this test, we think it's going to be able to be out there in the market for um, less money. So what are the objectives? The objectives are to find lymphoma before it's there and kill it before it forms. We're going to develop a test for early detection and risk assessment. Our initial focus is going to be on this disease called diffuse large cell lymphoma. That's about 50% of the lymphoma cases. And it is pretty serious. It's hard to treat. Um, and the solution uh, may be EVAT, but we're actually working, we're going to be working on a completely separate, not Lyra, but a parallel project. Uh, so if somebody has $5 million sitting around, uh, we, we are taking donations. But we are going to, to essentially develop that, that project independently. And the focus is going to be on intelligent use of the immune system. And the immune system is powerful and it can, it can kill you. So we don't want to use the immune system to kill you. We want to use the immune system to prevent the disease. Okay. So Lyra will have a set aside group for goldens, but lymphoma is a disease of dogs. Um, we will use samples from the Golden Nature Lifetime Study because it's amazing to have that. And we can actually go and look at the history of dogs that developed and that didn't develop. And we can say, how good is it? And when can we pick it up? But we're not going to have breed restrictions. So we're actually going to be able to go back and confirm that your 16-pound mutt and your 80-pound, you know, whatever, and your golden are essentially uh, no different in terms of risk about getting lymphoma or doing detection. 
So how will we get there? We'll recruit healthy young dogs, dogs with known diseases to do a training set, much like Shine On. We'll measure the bits of DNA, create patterns, use artificial intelligence, and investigate if we find this risk environment created by the bits of DNA rather than by the cells. Um, we estimate that Lyra will continue for eight to 10 years, so this three-year project is just the beginning. Um, every dog that is enrolled, we intend to follow for their lifetime, so the first chunk of money is great but it only gets us about a third of the way there. Um, and prevention, um, again, we think that EBAT will have a place, or EBAT 2, because we're continuing to work on generating this deep bench of products that are safe enough to use in healthy humans or animals to do prevention. Um, but we will be developing other things um, that are geared specifically to develop uh, lymphoma prevention and mostly on the immune system uh, independent from Lyra. So how will we achieve our vision that I told you earlier? You know, create a world where we no longer fear cancer. Find cancer before it starts, what we call earliest detection, risk assessment. Kill it before it forms. So do this as an intervention that is safe in healthy individuals. And we have to find ways to do this in a way that supports graceful aging. So again, to remind you, the SOS test can detect undiagnosed cancers or a high-risk environment maybe as far out as four years or longer in dogs. We estimate we could do the same thing 20 years before cancer starts in humans. Shine On approach is unique because we can offer a solution when we actually detect this risk um, state. Uh, Lyra basically seeks to develop a comparable test for early detection that is as reliable and more accessible than the SOS test. And as we work to reduce the impact of cancer, we have to be mindful to promote graceful aging. So with that, a uh, great thank you to all the people that have and groups that have paid. So of course, GRF um, and GRCA as a partner, Canine Health Foundation, Morris Animal Foundation, Boxers, Porties, um, your tax dollars, our uh, amazing people that serve in our military services and many other people. And, and of course, I can't stop without mentioning uh, Taylor DePaul, who's now a grad student in our mic uh, micro cancer biology program, who was really the engine. Um, Ashley, who runs my lab and has taken this as her passion now. Uh, Ali, um, who's done all our machine learning and really the whole team that's worked with us and uh, our collaborators. And there's many people who um, we could not fit in here. And my, my golden retriever and my African wild dog. <laughs> Thank you. Some of these will be pretty quick answers, um, but I'm going to go through the questions that we've received uh, most frequently, and then we'll open it up to, to questions yeah. from uh, the audience. Can I interrupt you for a sec? For those of you who have other things to do or who want to go karaoke, uh, I won't take offense. So <laughs> if you need to leave, um, um, don't feel obligated as you have to stay. And if if you have a question about your own dog, please don't ask it in the group. I'll hang out for a little bit, and you can come and ask me later. Okay. Go. And, and, and uh, some of these he covered sort of in the talk, but we. But made before it. you walk out, you have to have the commercial. Okay. Which of course is that you did get the literature, and if you heard me talk at the welcome dinner and ask what breed or owner was affected by the and lymphoma, and you looked around, we are all in this. And if you think we just sit around at the table, um, I want you to know that in June, the foundation did send out $200,000 to Morris for Lyra. We also sent out $50,000, which we send every year for girls. And girls was to have ended after 10 years, and we have pledged to support it until the last dog is retrieved across the rainbow bridge, is that what we say? Yeah. <laughs> Close enough. Um, we also just received this month 49 research proposals from AKC's Canine Health Foundation. Um, they went to our Health and Genetics Committee. And, and Morris. And Morris. 
animal, animal animation. Animal. Well, <laughs> um, in, in the top ten, I believe, correct me, I believe six relate to Hamangio. But the important thing is each of these researchers, I don't know, I guess they want to take a lot of vacation. <laughs> but it seems the proposals, those of you who have worked in research and science, no. The proposals, probably 90% of them are asking for $200,000. You know, research is not cheap. And the pledge card, if you just did $10 a month, we are grateful. We, if you want to give him a million, we're happy. <laughs> or five. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and yes, before you leave and before we start on the questions, um, thank you for coming and thank you for all you do. And this has been an amazing quarter century partnership. So uh, I know many of you, many of you know me. Uh, some of you are, in, are, are new faces. Um, because of our age, we'll probably forget each other the minute we walk out. <laughs> but I really appreciate everything that you guys do and you being here. So questions. And, and also, just to elaborate one more uh, minute on the Lira project, GRF pledged 200,000. Uh, Morris has already pledged 300,000. Um, so that project is um, pretty much a go, and, and we'll probably start uh, early next year. We have to wait for them to tell us that they like the science, but yeah. 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 Hopefully, the, the goal hopefully is that we will have ice dotted and T's crossed by the 1st of January. So that's our so goal. rapid fire on some of these. Okay. And then ask more follow-up if you'd like. Why do golden retrievers get so much uh, more cancer than other breeds? They don't really get more cancer than other breeds. They get as much cancer. So bigger dogs get more cancer than little dogs. We believe that size is a uh, stressor on aging. So big dogs age faster. And so we see more cancer in big dogs, but goldens are no different than any other dog of comparable size and shape. Why do American goldens get more cancer than European goldens? Because people say that, but it's not true. European goldens get as much cancer as American goldens. Um, since your research previously identified regions on chromosome 5 uh, related to hemangial and lymphoma, why don't we have a DNA test to breed it out? And when do you expect that we will? We don't have a DNA test because um, after the, so, so we actually filed a patent and we withdrew the patent because we realized that we realized that the test was useless because if you tried to breed it out, you'd get a naked mole rat, so. Okay. Um, and I mean, it's useless, right? We don't know that you'd get a naked mole rat. You might get a haired rat, but it, <laughs> it would not be a golden retriever. From a dog who died from cancer, should they stop using it? And at what age of death from cancer would be a red flag to stop using the frozen semen? So the answer is you should make your breeding decisions on things that you know and that you can control and not on things that you believe emotionally. So if your stud dog died of cancer, uh, we already said it's not a heritable condition. It doesn't pass from the sire to the offspring. So you are not changing the cancer risk. The offspring are going to have whatever the cancer risk is, and it's independent of whether uh, there were dogs in the line, in the litter, the sire, the dam. So you can use that sperm unconditionally. If the, if the sire died when it was two, uh, maybe you don't want to use it because there might be a lot of other things that you don't know about the sire. But otherwise, I would not use cancer as a breeding decision. And the only time that I would worry about heritability is if a particular breeding or a particular individual starts dropping um, litters where 50% of the litter develops cancer before the age of three. So if you have repeated three. So if you have repeated events of a litter where half of the, half of the dogs develop cancer that is a similar cancer before the age of three, then I think that merits investigation. And that's exactly how we found the uh, uh, big name that's abbreviated RCND in German Shepherds. There was a sire in Norway that started dropping litters that uh, were affected by this really, really, really rare disease. Um, and so they took the sire, they moved it into a lab, they did a bunch of experimental breedings. They found that he actually had a mutation in chromosome, um, I don't remember the chromosome, but it was the folliculin gene. 
And this mutation predisposed to this rare complex of cancers. And we were able to essentially eliminate that disease before it established. So we still see the tumor very rarely. It's not necessarily heritable. Um, we have the, we can test for the mutation, but it doesn't come from the parent. So if you saw that you, there was a dog that was dropping litters where more than half of the dogs develop cancer before the age of three, then start worrying about it. Otherwise, it is really just sort of the luck of the, all the other things that I showed you. Okay. Um, what are the best diets to reduce cancer risk, uh, or are there certain types of diets to avoid? Please address uh, cooking at high temperatures, such as the way most extruded dry foods are processed, causing carcinogens to form, and also address raw diets. Okay. So the best diet is a diet that's balanced um, for your dog. Uh, the best way to feed your dog is to keep it lean. We, we recommend brain activity and physical activity because that's what dogs need. Um, we don't really care how you make the food. If you use raw diets, you have to be really careful because there are risks for raw diets to the preparer and to the dog from contaminants, salmonella, listeria, all these other things. So if you use raw diets, source your ingredients from reputable people and you know, be really careful. Um, the data for extruded meat is that if you, could make, if you cook meat at high temperatures, you create things that are classified as carcinogens. But when we actually did the study, we found that um, healthy dogs over the age of 10 have as much of this stuff in their, accumulated in their hair, which is sort of a storage place, as dogs that had cancer. And there's absolutely no difference. So dogs are not getting cancer because they're eating commercial dog food. Um, this stuff is, is present in commercial dog food and it accumulates, but it doesn't have any known health effects. So if you like the convenience of commercial dog food like I do, and if your dog likes commercial dog food like my girls do, there's no problem with feeding commercial dog food. Um, if I was going to cook for them, I would go to a nutritionist and I would have them pre prepare a list of what is a balanced diet that I could give them and I would, f and, and I would know that I wasn't harming them. So things not to feed um, poison, you know, <laughs> that one's easy. Um, Twinkies, probably not the great thing. Um, I, we used to have a dog that loved Twinkies, probably not the, the best thing to give it to her. Th there's really nothing is, is what I'm saying, is, is you can feed your dog whatever you think is right. There's, there's now a lot of data suggesting that um, um, treats in moderation are great because it creates a uh, social bond between you and your dog. You love giving your dog a treat. Your dog loves getting a treat from you. And you can make the dog food be the treat. It's, it's the action of giving the treat that helps. But I can tell you that my dogs know the difference between a kibble and a square of Swiss cheese. And, and the square of Swiss cheese makes them a lot happier. At least I think so. So, so I, I, I think that it's, um, my mother said everything in moderation. And um, don't work on the assumption that diet is going to prevent cancer or give cancer. Use the diet as a way to keep your dog healthy. Okay. Are there any supplements that reduce cancer risk? No. Uh, there are no su let, let me actually say that. There are no supplements that reduce cancer risk. If you're spending money on supplements and you love to spend your money, keep doing it. But if you are thinking that it's going to reduce cancer risk, you are not going to get there. So there are no supplements that reduce cancer risk. Um, once, a dog, once a dog has cancer, are there any cancer-starving diets or supplements that help fight it? No, there are none. And, and all of the stuff that's advertised, all of the natural treatments, whatever, there are no data that any of those things work. There are data that some of them can be harmful because they're not regulated and we don't know what's in there. The European Medicines Agency has tested some of these all-natural supplements, and they have found antibiotics, corticosteroids, prednisone, um, hormones like estrogens and progestins and androgens, um, and, and a variety of other things, including chemotherapy. So if you give a supplement, um, you do not know what you're giving because it doesn't matter what's on the bottle. It's not regulated. Nobody tests. And there is now solid evidence that uh, uh, Turkey tail mushrooms and Yunnan bio don't work for hemangiosarcoma. So we, we have data. They don't do anything. If, if you are 
in a battlefield situation and have Yunnan bio paste and your buddy gets shot, the Yunnan bio paste is a really good thing to stop the bleeding as a paste on the wound. If you get oral surgery, the Yunnan bio paste is a really good thing to stop the bleeding on the tooth they extracted. The Yunnan bio pill has no activity whatsoever. So $2,000 a, a bottle, spend it on treats. Don't spend it on Yunnan bio. Same for turkey tail mushrooms and, and pretty much for any supplement. There is no, it, it's very easy for people that are um, well-intentioned but ill-informed at best or predatory at worst to take advantage of other people that are in a desperate situation because they themselves or one of their family members, be it a human or a dog, has a terminal disease and they are very vulnerable. And it's a terrible thing to do. So um, I know that sometimes people feel better. They say, well, at least I'm doing something. Like I said, take your dog for a walk in the park, play ball, give him a treat. It's going to do more good than any supplement that you can get. What about the low fat diet? Because we talked about cancer cells utilizing fat. That's a really good question. And it's been looked at. Um, and there is no evidence that low fat diets are any better than regular fat diets as long as the dogs are lean. So if you use a higher fat diet and you feed the same amount and the dog starts gaining bad weight and getting obese. So where fat matters is if you have a, a lean individual and a fat individual and they both have the same risk for starting a cancer. If the cancer starts, it'll run much more rapidly in the fat individual because it's got all that food but it doesn't really reduce the risk of a cancer developing. So, so the low fat diet is not really going to change the risk of the cancer developing. And it's not going to change the risk if the dog is equally lean. But if you use a high fat diet and you increase the fat content in the body, then if there is a cancer, it's gonna run away faster. So I think that you can achieve the purpose with a balanced diet um, and I would talk to a nutritionist about the composition because I'm not a nutritionist. So what is the lowest level of fat that you can feed? What is the highest level of protein that you can feed? You want to make sure that you keep the kidneys happy. The brain needs fat, right? So you, I mean, too, too little fat is not good for the brain. So I would basically talk to a nutritionist and really think about the whole of the dog and not focus on like, is this diet going to prevent cancer? Okay. Um, does over-vaccination weaken dogs' immune systems no. causing cancer? No. <laughs> there is no. Does over-vaccination weaken dogs' immune systems and cause cancer? Otherwise, the answer is no. Uh, I, I am not an advocate for vaccinating against everything all the time. I'm an advocate for looking at uh, what are the regulations that you have to meet so that if your dog gets picked up by the pound, they don't, you know, quarantine it for months. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, what are the exposures? Because a dog that hangs out in the couch in a you know, high-story high New York apartment is going to be very different than a dog that travels to shows or agility or you know, goes to dog parks. So I think look at the exposures, look at where you live, uh, and make your decisions about vaccination and other preventatives based on what your dog is likely to encounter and not based on just a blanket, this is what happens to a dog. So we don't use heartworm preventative the same way that they would use it in Florida, right? We live in Minnesota, we have winter. Hello, winter, right? Um, we vaccinate uh, uh, for, for rabies because we have to. Um, I, I think it's not a bad idea to titer your dogs if you want, um, but remember, depending on where you live, if you don't vaccinate for rabies, you could be liable. But the, the DHPs, you know, you could choose after the second or third one, you could choose to maybe not do it. And I think it's a conversation that you have with your vet. But does adding the vaccination hurt your dog and weaken its immune system? No. I am, a, I am an immunologist. I know what I'm talking about. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, there are some scientific papers that say that uh, neutering uh, increases the risk of some cancers in goldens. Can you comment? Can you yes. Care? So um, there is such a thing as understanding statistics, and there is such a thing as using statistics poorly. And virtually all of the papers that talk about a risk of neutering are either starting with uh, biased data sets, are using statistics very poorly, or are not accounting for age. 
So um, I think that that story is pretty much refuted. And one of the easiest things to do is when you look at data that look like the stock market on a crazy week. So if they say, oh, the risk is three times higher if you go and neuter them at uh, six months, but then it's only half as much if you neuter them at one year, and then it goes up again. So if it's going like this, that's not biology. So we know, for example, with, with spaying, if you spay dogs before their first heat, you virtually eliminate the risk of mammary cancer. Females, right? I'm talking about females. If you spay dogs after the first heat but before the second heat, um, you reduce that risk by more than 90%. If you spay after the second heat, you pretty much lose the effect. So there's a, there's a clear dose response related to the hormonal exposure and the timing, uh, and that is biology. Right? If it goes kind of like the crazy stock market, that's not biology, that's artifact and statistics. And so um, I think that, again, you should think about if you're, if you're homing a, a dog to a pet home and you don't think that dog should be bred, the easiest way to make sure that dog isn't bred is to neuter and spay them, right? The, the Swedes and the Norwegians think that we're barbarians and they will scream at you and tell you that you don't need to do that. And they might be right. But, but in our society, in our culture, where we have dog overpopulation problems, I think it's a reasonable alternative. But um, keeping a dog intact simply because you think it's going to have issues with cancer is not the right answer. Uh, and I think it just depends. Neutering and spaying should be considered as, as a context of the whole situation. Uh, how, how much hormone do dogs need and when do they need it? And not because you think that spaying or neutering is going to change cancer risk. But we do know that in females, if you wait more than two cycles to spay or neuter them, the risk for mammary cancer goes from essentially zero to about 10 to 15%. They're not all going to be malignant, but you know, one in 10 of, your, of female dogs that are not spayed are going to get it. Okay, and you, again, you sort of touched on some of these things, but if there's anything you'd like to add, um, and this is a couple questions in one. Does exposure to lung chemicals such as Roundup cause lymphoma in dogs like it does in people? Um, are organic fertilizers safer than non-organic? Are there herbicides or fertilizers to stay away from? So the answer is um, the data are contradictory, so we don't know. But by and large, when people have looked at it carefully, the risk is no. And so I'll tell you an anecdote. I got a call from a law firm. And they asked me if I would be an expert witness. And the case was a conglomerate of people that were suing Bayer Monsanto for Roundup in lymphoma. And what I told them was, you do not want me on your list of expert witness because when they ask, does Roundup cause lymphoma? I'm going to say no. And they'll say, but it causes lymphoma in people. And I'll say, that was a wrong judgment. And it's under appeal, and it will be reversed. So no. So you don't want me on the plaintiffs. I said, but Monsanto doesn't want me on the, def on the defendant list because if they say, is Roundup safe? I will say, no, Roundup kills all of our pollinators and it's terrible for the environment. And so, no, we, we, you know, it, it is indiscriminate use of Roundup is a really bad thing. So Monsanto doesn't, so, so you guys know, you know, I don't care if you're gonna pay me 750 bucks an hour. I love getting paid 750 bucks an hour, but I'm not gonna take the case on either side because I don't believe that Monsanto, there's any evidence that Roundup causes cancer. But similarly, I don't believe that people should just be, you know, um, using uh, Roundup indiscriminately in their GMO crops, not because there's any risk to us in terms of the GMOs, but because I love butterflies and bees and I don't like to see them killed. Okay, organic fertilizers versus non-organic? Uh, you know, I... I, I, I am a greenie. I mean, I could live in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> so I would say, given the choice, I would choose organic over non-organic. Um, but it's probably marketing, and I'm as, as liable to be influenced by marketing as not. So I would say, whenever you can, choose organic, because we think we're doing good things for the environment. But in terms of cancer risk, there's no data. Um, any particular herbicides or fertilizers linked to cancer risk? No, there are no, again, the, the data are very contradictory. When you look at the data carefully, there's no link. And so what you use, uh, you know, I look at my, my neighbor's pond and it is iridescent green from all the nitrogen. And so I wish that they would stop having a beautiful green lawn and maybe they would have a beautiful pond instead of an iridescent green pond. 
Um, but, you know, I, like I said, I'm not king of the world. I can't tell them what to do. So I think that we, we need to be thinking in terms of all of these environmental exposures, we should be thinking past ourselves and what's going to happen. However many of you are parents, grandparents, you know, if you have dogs and grand dogs, what kind of world we're going to leave behind for them. And I think that's a lot more important than worrying about whether our own dog or ourselves are going to get cancer from this exposure because that's we might get cancer, but it will probably have nothing do, to do with that exposure. And so I, I, I would really think the, the frame of thought needs to be moved into what are we doing for the earth and less into what's going to happen to our dog. Uh, similar questions regarding uh, household cleaning products. Uh, Same answer. Pesticides. Same answer. Okay. Um, well, you've talked about a couple of these other things, and I want to give the audience yeah. a chance. So one more question. Is there anything we can do to reduce the risk of cancer in our dogs? Shine on. I <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I am biased. Uh, I admit it. Um, I think that they're, they're, um, the, the one thing that we know is keep your dogs lean and healthy. Lean and healthy. There's, there's really good data. It works if you're a mouse. It works if you're a fruit fly. It works if you're a monkey. It works if you're a human. And there's a tiny little bit of data from the Purina study that it works if you're a dog. So keep your dog lean and healthy. It'll be better for their joints. It'll be better for their mental health. It'll be better for their physical health. And it might be better for their cancer. So that's the one thing we know that we can all do. And uh, we, we worry about a lot about our girls when they start looking like they're, do you all know the one to nine Purina scale for? So, so when our girls start getting to five and a half, we start freaking out and we cut back on food and treats. So we really want them to be between four and a half and five. And, and I would like to be four and a half and five, so I'm riding 200 miles a, a month on my bike or more. Uh, if anybody cares about childhood cancer, I am doing a ride this month and I will take pledges if anybody wants. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, and I'm, I'm definitely not a, four, not a four and a half or a five, right? But, but I'm trying. So I think that that's really the best thing that we, can, that we know how to do. How about the role of exercise? Do you think it plays a, a role in Yes, I think that there's really good, really good but early data that um, exercise added to uh, conventional therapies, regardless of whether it's surgery, radiation, chemo, or immunotherapies, uh, accelerates recovery and might delay uh, relapse. Uh, in terms of prevention, I think it's all tied to sort of that lean body mass, and so I don't know. But I think that there's, there, there are emerging data sets that um, both strength and aerobic conditioning or exercises during rehab um, are going to be beneficial in terms of speed of recovery, uh, reducing side effects, and maybe delaying relapse. So uh, I'm, you know, exercise is good. Not all of us like it, but exercise is good. And I was going to say thank you so much for sticking around, and it's your turn. Question. Um, I feel like uh, years ago I would hear about hemangio and the spleen. And as, as time has passed on, then you started to hear it more around the heart. Now you're starting to hear some cutaneous hemangio. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yep. So um, spleen is still the favorite place for these cells to colonize and grow. Um, what we think happens is that the cells actually come from the bone marrow, and we actually have some really cool new data. It's already on bioarchive. It'll probably be published in the next few months. That hemangiosarcoma seems to start from cells in the bone marrow that are called nerve cells. They're the cells that actually support the development of your blood cells. And we think that what happens is that those cells live in other blood-forming organs, like the spleen and the liver, but they also travel. And so we think that when in the earliest stages of hemangiosarcoma, those cells travel and they go to areas like the kidney and the liver and the omentum and the brain and the spleen and the heart, and that the spleen is really the favorite part for them to grow. But sometimes the environment in the spleen might be sufficiently immune or hypoxic or something, and they, they don't grow there, but they grow in the heart or in the skin or in the kidneys. <coughs> um, so... I think the reason that you see more heart now than we did then is simply because we have better tools. So, you know, the dogs died and nobody looked at the heart because, you know, it was hard. But now we do and we find it. So I think that that's simply just better, better detection. Um, we've always seen 
so, so there are two types of hemangiosarcoma in the skin. One that, that forms actually in the skin layers, we call dermal or cutaneous, and that one that forms under the skin layers that we call subcutaneous. So the dermal is a totally different beast. Um, most of those are not terrible, but they can be. Um, and certainly the ones that, that are the, the ones that when you see the first nodule, there's so already four, tend to be bad. The ones that seem to be a nodule that just kind of grows tend to be really good, and you can cut those out, and the dogs will be cured. Um, and, and again, they're very different, and we can see them, and we can measure them. Sometimes they'll go to the viscera, but not always. The ones under the skin drive us crazy because they're totally unpredictable, and we can't grade them. They can behave really, really well and do nothing. They can uh, um, be ones that we cut them out, and they never come back, or we radiate them, and, we, and they never come back. And they can be rapidly metastatic and resistant to therapy, and we don't have good ways to tell them apart. So we, th we think, in hemangiosarcoma of the spleen, but th this seems to be um, true for hemangiosarcoma of any viscera and for hemangiosarcoma under the skin, we have characterized at least three types, maybe five. And if you look at the type that we call angiogenic, which is the most common, it is lethal, and virtually completely resistant to therapy. And um, Aaron, Aaron's data suggests that there might be a, a, a small segment of those really, really bad angiogenics that can respond really well to Prodox. Prodox is the propranolol um, doxorubicin <coughs> therapy. So she's, she's characterized a, a signature, and she's following up on that signature. And that actually was just funded by Morris, so we're really excited. So that's really cool work that she's doing. And Prodox has enrolled the last dog, so you'll be seeing data from Prodox in the next year or so. Um, the inflammatory type, which is the second type, is 50% um, of them are really terrible and, and they're incurable. And the other 50% account for virtually every hemangiosarcoma that when you talk to people and they go, my dog lived two years. Um, every one of those that we've ever measured and characterized was an inflammatory one. And by the way, these subtypes, we cannot, we cannot characterize them under the microscope. They're based on patterns of genes that are turned on and off. Um, and and so, so there's 50% of the inflammatories that if we could actually pick them up early, we could actually tell you if you do therapy on this dog, your chances of being alive a year are 100%. But we, we can't do that yet. So we know 50% of them, we need to figure out what's the difference between the bad ones and the good ones. The third type is one that we call adipogenic. And these are guys that um, eat fat, make fat, swim in fat, live, love fat, and they're really rare. We only have a handful of these, and we don't really know if they're bad or good. We think they're bad, but we don't really know. Um, um, and then we know that there's at least two types that seem to have mixed uh, lineage. So they're inflammatory angiogenic or angiogenic adipogenic. And, and we don't know enough about them to tell you if, if they're good or bad. So I think as, as we keep going and we start being able to offer these, you know, it may be that at some point companies like Vidium and Phytocure will be able to offer these types of answers. And you'll be able to tailor the therapy more to whether it's angiogenic or inflammatory. So the angiogenic, uh, virtually all of them have mutations in either P53 or another gene called PI3 kinase. Uh, my former postdoc, John Kim at Florida, is actually looking at targeting PI3 kinase, and he's got some really, really exciting data. So he might be the guy that comes up with how to treat these horrible angiogenic ones. Um, so so it, it's going to take some time, but we know a couple of things. We, you can have a dog that has metastatic hemangiosarcoma diagnosis, and the one in the spleen is inflammatory, the one in the heart is angiogenic, and the one in the liver is adipogenic. So it's not a genetic thing, it's a, an environment thing. So it, it makes it really hard because you go, oh, I've, I'm gonna treat the inflammatory one and the angiogenic doesn't respond, right? So it's, 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 it's a, a terrible, difficult beast. But going back to your question, hard ones are bad because of the location. It's kinda hard to take the heart out, right? Like the spleen. Um, so the spleen we can take out, the heart we can't. Um, we see more of it because we can detect it. And the cutaneous, one are, cutaneous ones are understudied. They're, they're different. It's a different tumor of the blood vessels. Uh, and we don't know much about it, so we just treat it the same way because that's all we know how to do. And uh, 
ones that are non-metastatic tend to be really, really good. And the ones that are metastatic tend to be really, really bad. And we just need more time and effort and smart people to look at them. So if some of these are part, partly as an inflammatory response, it, would there be any benefit to starting your dog just on a low-dose anti-inflammatory at, like, a yeah. at six? Or maybe like using something like a Benadryl or something to inhibit that response? That, that's a, So the question is, um, would using something that dampens down the inflammation help? And so one of the things that we know is that because these cells um, promote the growth of blood cells, they are actually making their own little bone marrow in the tumor. They're giving rise to inflammatory cells. And we don't know how, if, how necessary those cells are, and we don't really know how effective uh, anti-inflammatory therapy would, would be. So the answer is we don't know. At one point, um, before MAGIC, we had actually proposed a $5 million trial to look at... Um, uh, it was anti an, a regimen of anti-inflammatory, uh, low dose, sort of like low dose aspirin, but in dog version. And um, um, it, it's it's an, an antioxidant that one of our uh, team has been working on for years in terms of lung cancer prevention. And and they have some interesting data. You know, it's not a home run, but it does seem to do something. Um, but it, it was a hard sell. They said um, that. The, the investment to outcome risk is too high. So we've never done that, that study, but I think it would be cool if somebody did t take a control, kind of like the nurse's study, right? And they took a lifetime and they said, we're going to start these dogs on some safe and logical prevention and see what happens. I mean, you might have heard of the vaccine study that out of Arizona State that's being done at UC Davis and Colorado and Wisconsin, and they have a vaccine that um, turns the immune system on to make antibodies against a certain pattern of proteins that seem to be present in cancer cells. They may or may not have anything to do with the actual cancer process, but they're present in cancer cells. Um, and I think it's the, the guy who started, um, the company is called Calviri. The guy who founded the company is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think the strategy is really creative. I think it's super cool. Um, we already know that it doesn't work all the time. Some of the dogs that, that have been vaccinated did get cancer, but we don't have all the data. So I think, you know, if, if this bears out, I think it would be a major, major step forward. You know, it may not prevent all of the cancers, but if it can reduce the burden, that would be great. So I think there's a lot of people trying different approaches, and we just have to wait and see. I would say if you're using any anti-inflammatory, talk to your veterinarian because they are not innocuous, right? So they affect the kidneys and the liver and bleeding. And it took me five years to convince my own physician that I was going to go off of low-dose aspirin because I woke up every morning with a nosebleed, you know. And so I, I, it, it really wasn't doing much for my cardiovascular risk because it's really low. And it was giving me nosebleeds. And so uh, aspirin is a really good anticoagulant. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that you should do it under the guidance of a professional. So. Okay. It is getting late. Any other questions? I'm, I'm happy to stay, but I don't want you guys to feel like you have to. Any, any benefit to the um, ovary-saving space? That is a really good question. Um, there's probably no benefit in the context of hormone-driven cancers like mammary cancer. But there's probably really good benefit in the context of overpopulation. So to the extent that hormones are good, like to strengthen the joints and close the growth plates and stuff, I think that's a really good solution, right? Because you keep the hormones and the girls are not going to get pregnant. Uh, but if your goal is to say, I do not want my 10-year-old um, uh, dog to, to be at high risk for mammary cancer, then it's not doing much because the risk is still there. And so I think that it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to say, I want to be able to control population, but I don't want to take away the hormonal benefits, then I think that's a really good solution. Same, same thing with vasectomy, right? And I, I know some people do canine vasectomies. It's not something I would try because I'm not a good surgeon, but it would be the same kind of thing. But there, there are some benefits to testosterone. There are some drawbacks to testosterone, and it just depends on whether you want to keep it. So. Well, it's a realistic trial time for EVAP. 
available? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, um, so so the, the honest answer is I don't know. But um, I believe that it is in, um, it, it's rounded third and it's going home with FDA. So, so if it's rounded third and it's going home, I suspect that it, it is possible that approval will come in 23 or 24. And it could be available um, through the network that the company decides to put together then. Because it'll have to go to a community. So it'll get conditional approval and it'll have to go to a community trial. So I'm hoping that. The question is, when will EBAT be available in the market? And, and EBAT will, will not be approved for prevention. So prevention will remain experimental and probably exclusively through us. But maybe they, they might decide to launch a prevention trial. So we'll have to talk to them. We, I, am not, I, I do not consult for the company, and I'm not on their board. And so um, I, I only get, I, only get <laughs> I get contacted when they need something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is OK. Um, uh, I don't know. So um, um, it really depends on um, whether our board is uh, adamant about respecting the market and telling us that we can't launch in dogs until we have a human version, or whether we can go to dogs early without a human version, because that's a difference between a 120 million race versus maybe a 12 million race. So, so I don't know. But, but I think uh, SOS would probably be ready uh, um, if the wisdom of the board uh, allowed it and we had somewhere on the order of 12 million bucks, it probably would be ready to go tomorrow. It would be version one, though. Version two won't be ready for another five years, I would say. Yeah. So it's the company that makes the EBAT its own Entity that's going to manufacture it when it does reach the marketplace, or does it have? Do they have to hook up with another pharmaceutical company? Or yeah, that's a good question. So I don't, I don't know the answers because I'm not involved. Um, but I know that um, um, there have been a lot of discussions with uh, um, contract manufacturing. So uh, I believe that it'll probably be manufactured by contract, and and that all the QC will be done by the manufacturer. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I can tell you how much it costs us to make and to treat a dog, right? So when we, when we account for, for everything from manufacturing to treatment, including like all of our tech's time and salary and stuff for one cycle, our cost is somewhere on the order of 3,500 bucks. That's, that's our cost. And so when you add the profit line, uh, economy of scale, right? So if you treat 100 dogs, you can make it a lot cheaper than if you treat one. Mm -hmm. So it is IV. It is IV, slow infusion by pump. It, if you give it as a bolus, uh, you increase the risk of uh, hypotension, and you can actually cause seizures. So we have to give it as a slow IV uh, infusion. It's about a 30-minute infusion, and then we keep the dogs around for about an hour. So, yeah. We haven't seen, by the way, we haven't seen any... Other, other than the elevated liver enzymes that come down usually by day three when they happen, we haven't seen any effects of hypotension or anything like that after. The only things that we've seen in some cases is a little bit of upset tummies. Like some of the owners will tell us, you know, they didn't want to eat. So do you suspect it will probably be available to veterinary oncologists first? Yes, like exclusively. Because I'm a general practice. Exclusively to veterinary oncologists, yeah. How late in the process, I mean, my experience with Manjo has been a dog that suddenly has crashed. Yeah. And we're off to the emergency room. So we, we haven't tested it in the advanced stage very much. The, the success that we had was in dogs that had stage one or two, so confined to the spleen that bled. One of our trials was confined to the spleen with meds that we could take out surgically. Um, we know that, um, so the data in the dogs that had um, stage one or stage two, meaning it, it was in the spleen and it didn't matter if it bled. And we um, had the dogs have surgery, so we removed the spleen, waited 10 days, gave EBAT over the course of a week, waited two weeks, and then gave chemo. So as a group, the median survival was doubled. So that the survival time went from about four months to three and a half months to seven months or four to eight months. The number of dogs that made it out to a year and a half went from 
10% to about 35%. Um, but most of the dogs, um, and, and this is a 23 dog study, most of the dogs by the end of four years were dead. So, so they either, some died of something else, but some relapsed uh, very late on. Uh, in, in the third EBAT trial, we took dogs that were, were, we didn't really care where the tumor was or what stage they were. And, and so the question was, is it safe? In the context of giving chemo first and then EBAT, EBAT first and then chemo, uh, if they have cardiac disease, do we make the heart blow up? You know? and, and so it passed the safety um, data with flying colors. Um, we know that some of the dogs that had stage three lived longer than we would have expected for sure. But, but it's anecdotes, right? We have 29 dogs and we have a handful of dogs that were advanced stage and got EBAT with whatever else. Um, we, we forbade the owners from using turkey tail, Yunnan bio, and other <clears throat> supplements. So the therapies were surgery, uh, chemo, or other clinical trials. And we know that some of the dogs did live longer, but we just don't have data that we can aggregate and say, we think this is gonna work. So I think that's gonna happen when the company brings it out and they organize the trials and they actually decide how it's gonna go through approval, whether it's gonna be a very conservative stage one, two between surgery and chemo or whether they're going to do all, all comers and do other things. So we'll just have to wait and see. I can tell you that if we take mice and they have big honking tumors, and we give them EVAD, nothing happens, the mice die. If we take mice and, we, and they have little tumors, um, we can actually get really, really good survivals. And some of the time, the tumor just stops growing. It doesn't go away, it stops growing, and the, the mice can live until the end. And in some of the mice, it uh, melts away. So a dog is not a mouse, but it, it definitely won't work as a standalone therapy in advanced disease but it might be a component of therapy um, in, in the advanced disease stage for some conditions. And because it activates the immune system, we're actually trying with, of course, everybody's doing immune checkpoints. So we uh, partnered with a colleague from Yale who developed his own immune checkpoint, which is a different um, beast, and uh, uh, we call it Onyx. And so we are trying uh, EVAT with Onyx in... Um, Osteo, and we're trying onyx with uh, oncolytic viruses in sarcomas, advanced sarcomas, and lymphomas. So there's there's a lot of cool activity going on. Yep. In dealing with osteosarcoma, is there anything that might has been proven to be perhaps more effective as a plan of treatment or sequencing of treatments? Yeah. Um, so if you look at the data, there are um, now tens of papers that, that say that immunotherapies that activate the first arm of the immune system, what we call the innate immune system, um, always show benefit in, in dogs. There, there's, there's really no good data in humans, but in dogs, they always show benefit. Um, the one that came closest, well, there's two that have come close to the market. One was uh, what's called LMTPPE, which is approved in Europe and has a name that I don't remember. Uh, and it's a... Uh, uh, a bacterial cell wall from something that's related to tuberculosis. It's not TB, but it's a c close cousin. And then it's uh, uh, enveloped in a thing that makes it last longer. And it, it's not a miracle cure, but it definitely works to extend life in some proportion of the dogs, and some of them get durable um, uh, remissions. And that's, that's, that, though, that work was done in the 80s. And so again, it's approved in Europe uh, it's hard to get here. Um, not many people use it. The Listeria vaccine came really, really close. It, it went through approval. It went through a clinical trial. There's a lot of things about that, that vaccine that I don't know, and there's a, a few things that I do know, but I can't tell you. But I think that the Listeria vaccine was a, an awesome candidate, and it didn't, it didn't make it not because it was a bad therapy. It didn't make it because it was a hard therapy to get to market, and it was mis mishandled. But I can tell you that the, the same therapy is going into a kid trial this year. So, so the science is telling the physicians that they should use this in kids. And I, I, I'm very excited about that, and I think it's cool. And I think it, it would have been possible to make that work. And if the Morris trial ends up showing benefit, maybe 
it will be re resurrected. Um, but there's nothing commercially that you can go and buy and use that really works. And most of the other drug trials, have the data have been negative. So there's a beautiful paper published last year, this year in clinical cancer research, <coughs> led by the group at the NCI, where they took 250 dogs, half of them got standard of care, half of them got um, standard of care with rapamycin, or you know, a rapamycin derivative that was formulated correctly. And th there was the, the drug actually worked. I mean, the, the drug did what it was supposed to do. You could measure it in the blood. It, you know, affected the enzyme that it was supposed to affect. But in terms of outcome, there was absolutely no difference. The, the, the 125 dogs that got standard of care and the dogs that got the rapamycin, the curves are completely superimposable. So our Vigor trial used uh, oncolytic virus. Um, we saw a small proportion of dogs that did better than expected. So our, our durable remissions, the ones that lived forever, were higher than expected. <coughs> Um, so uh, we know that the dogs that did better than expected had more immune cells in their tumors to begin. And so we think the virus was, went in there, activated the cells that were there, and that increased the probability of uh, uh, immune response with durable remission. So we are now looking at virus plus immune, uh, a further immune stimulation. But um, down the road. Yeah, and I think the oncolytic virus... Uh, as a therapy for humans is going to be very doable, and it's already in trials. But in dogs, because the virus that we're using is derived from an, a reportable agricultural disease, I don't know that it's ever going to make it into the veterinary clinic. Because the, the, so, so the state of Minnesota for us, because it's a Mayo-Minnesota um, collaboration, but the USDA for anything outside of Minnesota has told us that if the dogs get treated in these clinical trials, they have to be in isolation between six hours and three days. And we find that owners are very reluctant to put their dogs in isolation for six hours, much less three days. So it's commercial potential when you would tell an owner your dog has to go and be away from everybody for three days. You know, it's, it's hard. So, but anyway, um, we, we continue to work and thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. kind of goes back to some of the questions she asked, but is there any, anything that says the coefficient of increase in dogs has to go to the not necessarily raise cancer, but that speed of aging or new needs? Um, I, yes, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I 